COVID. What was that one all about? Anyway, we'll see. Uh, it's a delight to introduce Sophie Clark, who used to work here and now works down the road, to tell us about COVID and thyroid and adrenal disease. I have no idea where this is going, but I'm sure you'll tell us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much um, for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here today to be talking to you all about COVID-19 and its impact on thyroid and adrenal disease. Now, I'm conscious that for many of us, COVID-19 posed some of the most challenging personal and professional experiences that we will have ever faced and may yet face again. And so I'm mindful of that, of that as we're talking about this topic. However, what I'm hoping to do today is to talk us through a timeline whereby we can look at the effect of COVID-19 on the thyroid and adrenal glands. And I hope that we can all see that whilst COVID-19 certainly is very different now with the advent of vaccines, it's by no means disappeared and still remains something that we as clinicians need to be aware of and managing. So if we think about the timeline of COVID-19 and we think back to those early months of 2020, we were suddenly aware that we were grappling with a respiratory virus that had significant serious consequences. However, case reports emerged as we'll start to see, and it raised the question of what does COVID-19 do to the endocrine system? Thankfully, there were survivors with things like the introduction of steroids and uh, the antiviral treatments that have really changed um, survivorship for COVID-19. And yet there's a significant cohort of patients, current estimates it's over 2 million patients in the UK alone who have remaining symptoms after COVID-19. And as I've mentioned already, vaccines um, have also brought in a new question about does the COVID-19 vaccine have any impact on the endocrine system? So if we think about COVID-19, it really did seem to come for some of us out of the blue. However, for our colleagues in Southeast Asia, there was the SARS virus caused by coronavirus 1, SARS-CoV-1, in the early 2020s. This was an epidemic respiratory virus that in July 2003 um, was thought to be finished because of infection disease control measures that had been brought into place. It was covered internationally at the time. We can see here the covers of Newsweek and Time. And it's so fascinating seeing those images of someone wearing a mask, which clearly at that time was thought to be a very um, frightening image, which has become something we're very used to now. But clearly, even after SARS, there was a suggestion that there may well be endocrine effects from coronaviruses. So this was a paper that was published a couple of years later in 2005. Small study, 61 patients, but they were followed up at three month intervals after SARS and they did a whole load of blood tests. But slightly worryingly, they reported that at three months post infection, nearly 40% had hypocortisolemia. Although this had perhaps resolved within a year, and around 3% had transient subclinical thyrotoxicosis. Important to think about their definitions that you use for hypocortisolemia. So patients were deemed to have low cortisol levels if they had a morning cortisol of less than 180 or a peak response to a one microgram synaptin test that was less than 550 nanomoles. Now, many of us will know that we don't really typically use this one microgram short synaptin test in practice. And the reason being it's very challenging to draw up that one microgram dose accurately. Um, and indeed, there's very little data to standardize what a normal or typical response should be. And actually that 550 nanomole um, cutoff, even for 2005 is probably quite generous, I think some of us might say. Um, but clearly it's important for us that when we're thinking about the endocrine effects of COVID-19 to think about its precursors. So why is the endocrine system vulnerable? Well, we know probably some of us might remember this um, from the earlier days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Binding to the ACE2 receptor is really critical for that coronavirus to get into cells. So here we can see the SARS-CoV-2 virus molecule, and this is that spike protein that the news is constantly filled with. It has those two parts to it, which are critical for joining to the ACE2 receptor. There's this transmembrane protein, which is really important for the virus to gain cellular access. It cleaves these two parts, the spike protein, means the virus can then um, enter the cell and um, replicate. So both the ACE2 receptor and the TMPRSS2 are critical for entry um, into cells. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us as endocrinologists, because of our awareness of the condition, we know that there are certainly widespread ACE2 um, expression throughout the endocrine system, particularly in the thyroid gland, so both follicular and parafollicular cells, as well as the adrenal cortex. And if we think back to those early clinical signals from that SARS study, 
perhaps that might explain some things. So looking ahead, the thyroid gland is vulnerable. We know from post-mortem data that um, thyroid glands from patients who had died from SARS had direct damage to both the follicular and parafollicular cells. And outside of the context of COVID-19, we know that the serum ACE level, interesting, correlates with serum T3 and T4, perhaps suggesting that there is a relationship there. And as early emerges, as early reports emerged um, about the condition, there were lots of reports about subacute thyroiditis, particularly case reports emerging from Italy, where much of the pandemic was seen at its most severe in the early days. And so this caused groups to think about, well, what can we do? Now, you might remember back to those early days in terms of what we were able to do from a research setting initially was perhaps a little limited. This group looked um, in the UK at TSH levels for those patients who admitted to ITU in 2019, when the assumption was there were no COVID-19 cases in the UK, versus 2020. And they looked at TSH levels. And just to talk you through the slide, we can see that this green um, curve and the green here represents those in high dependency intensive care units in 2020 um, versus 2019 here. So we can see that CRP was higher, but then also there was a trend for a lower TSH. And so the authors argued that it was more likely that patients admitted with COVID-19 were going to have thyrotoxicosis than patients admitted with other conditions. A small number were followed up at 55 days post-admission. And importantly, there were ultrasound findings consistent with thyroid destruction or inflammation with thyroiditis. Another study that came out of Italy importantly looked at patients not admitted to ITU. And they had interesting um, definitions when they talked about what thyrotoxicosis was. So they had their free T4 cut off at 17, which depending on your assay might again be a little bit uh, generous. 10% had avert thyrotoxicosis, um, but the majority of patients had normal TFTs. And importantly, they showed that TSH was inversely associated with both age and IL-6. IL-6 being a marker of severe inflammation, as many of us will know already. So we then looked here at Imperial and thought, well, what can we get from our data? And in work led by um, Professor Tan and um, Bernard Ku, we looked at all patients who came into Imperial with suspected COVID-19. The benefit of this data was that we then had a control group. So we had those who had a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 versus those who didn't. And in our data set, we did not find any overt thyrotoxicosis. But similarly to that study that we talked about earlier, admission TSH was lower in those patients with COVID-19 and in those patients with admitted to ITU. And um, the great thing about data now is we do have some joined up data, particularly here in Northwest London. And for those patients who had thyroid function tests that we had access to, their TSH was lower on admission compared to pre-admission. And when we looked at that pattern of change, it was most consistent with non-thyroidal illness, which we'll come on to talk about a little bit later. Again, the only other thing that we need to be bearing in mind is COVID-19 did seem to trigger for some patients an immune storm, whereby there were handfuls of cases of Graves' disease in patients with no other autoimmune condition. So these were de novo cases of Graves' disease after COVID-19. And again, this seemed to be related to an IL-6 effect. Non thyroidal illness, some of us will be very familiar with, but it's a response to any physiological stress. And actually, it seems that COVID-19 places a particular stress um, physiologically. Initially, you get a reduction in total T3 and T4 with an increase in reverse T3. But it, critically, you do not get that TSH response rise. And over time, there's a global reduction in TSH from free T4 and free T3. And when we looked at our data, that's really what seemed to be going on in our patients here at Imperial. Um, and then when we looked at who was most likely to have it, it seemed to be those patients with moderate to severe acute COVID-19 who had NTI. And again, that fits with that IL-6 suggestion. Adrenal glands. Now, the vulnerability of the adrenal glands, the adrenal glands are vulnerable to um, effects by COVID-19. They're highly vascular. Um, and additionally, we know that there are both ACE2 receptors and mRNA in the adrenal cortex, as well as TMPRSS2. And so the adrenal glands are vulnerable, not just to their anatomy, but also due to their structure. And there have been several cases, as many of you might be aware of, of patients presenting with adrenal hemorrhage and infarct, again, related to that underlying pro-coagulopathy pro state that um, is conferred by COVID-19. Um, but most of the patients that have presented with adrenal hemorrhage and infarct have underlying medical conditions. This doesn't particularly seem to be a de novo uh, condition in patients with COVID-19 that's directly related to the virus. 
Um, recent data emerged um, in this year looking at 40 autopsy samples for patients who had died from um, COVID-19. And this is really the first direct data that we have that actually you do get some evidence of adrenal gland destruction in patients who die of COVID-19. So there was small vessel vasculitis, and importantly, they did identify the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in adrenocortical cells. So there certainly is some evidence now that at a tissue level, there may well be some um, inference from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There was no global adrenal gland destruction, however. Um, many of you might know social media, and um, this paper got quite a lot of attention because it's really the first hard evidence that we have that SARS-CoV-2 can be found in adrenal glands. But obviously, the kind of caveat to this data is this is patients who have died of COVID-19. And so how much the contributory effect of adrenal destruction is to that, it's important to say it's very challenging to kind of get that control group. Um, again, looking at data from here, we looked at cortisol levels um, in our data set, again, with work led by Professor Tan and Bernard Koo. And conversely, we did not find low cortisol levels in the first 48 hours of admission. So if we are seeing this adrenal destruction, it certainly seems to be a later effect um, for SARS-CoV-2. And we did find that high cortisol levels appear to be associated with an increased risk of mortality. And um, there's some evidence from an ITU setting that a condition called critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency can occur essentially just due to reduction of CRH production. But actually in our patients, when we compared it to other patients admitted to ITU, there was no increased proportion of that. Now, when we look essentially at this paper, which looked at the cortisol levels for patients who um, had COVID-19, um, this paper suggested that 64 patients had a cortisol level of less than 300, um, which in my mind in morning cortisol would always raise suggestions. This is a small study that was came out um, from, I believe, India from memory. Um, but this is small data sets. And to date, we really haven't seen these large numbers of patients with adrenal cortical insufficiency that we might anticipate were this to be a true issue in the literature. Um, so looking at the data to date, it seems that in an acute setting, adrenal function certainly remains preserved, with the exception being for those patients who have adrenal hemorrhage or infarct. Um, but we know, as I mentioned, that long COVID is a really significant challenge. So current estimates, as I said, suggest that about 2 million people in the UK currently have long COVID. It is a highly debilitating condition. It is heterogeneous. This group called Long COVID Support has been pivotal in driving research into the condition. And a paper they released in the summer suggested that there are about 200 symptoms that patients complain about with a diagnosis of long COVID. Now, clearly from an academic perspective, as well as a clinical perspective, that makes it a very challenging entity to assess and investigate. But a recent, um, and when we wanted to look at effects um, that are persistent, we wanted to look at are thyroid function tests different in patients with these symptoms? So here at Imperial, we brought patients back three months after they'd had acute COVID-19 and did lots of blood tests. We showed that um, free T4 and TSH were not different in those who had fatigue versus those who didn't. Our patients with long COVID did not have changes in thyroid function tests that corresponded to the severity of their symptoms. Um, so for the important message is that for all patients that we saw, TFTs were in range at three months. And again, this marries up with what we see clinically. So many of us, I'm sure, in our general endocrine clinics will have seen patients with abnormal TFTs who offer that they've recently had a diagnosis of COVID-19. You serially follow them up and their TFTs resolve with no treatment. That's something I picked up on in a few patients clinically. No difference in free T4 or TSH, regardless of presence of symptoms. And again, that's useful information. It can be challenging for a patient because they obviously want to have an explanation for the symptoms they're experiencing, but it can be very helpful for us to kind of cross things off lists as well as introducing things. When we looked at a synactin test, in our study, we did a 250 microgram short synactin test. The reason being that actually, if we want to know if something is a clinically relevant um, change in cortisol production, we are potentially going to be starting these patients on steroids. We want to have a validated test that's used internationally. And in our cohort, um, we have sent two patients post COVID-19. No patient had a suboptimal response to either 30 or 60 minutes um, when we gave them short uh, synactin, 250 micrograms. And again, this graph is important for us as clinicians, as well as patients. There was no difference in response by disease severity, if they went to ITU or not. There was also no difference um, when they had symptoms, which we'll come on to see as well. And so really for the patients that we saw, um, adrenal function was preserved at three months post COVID-19. Again, the caveat, these are survivors of COVID-19, not patients who've died of COVID-19, but adrenal function was preserved. 
And that was regardless of whether dexamethasone treatment or not was given. And again, that's important. We use very generous doses of dexamethasone when we're treating COVID-19. At three months follow-up, there doesn't seem to be any impact on um, adrenal status. Um, again, this is a data that we've talked about a little bit already, but here we can see it really broken down. So whether or not patients had tiredness or not, their response to a short synaptic test was not different, and neither was their baseline cortisol either. So again, if we're thinking about seeing patients in clinic, many of them are coming to our general endocrine clinics. I don't know if that's something you're experiencing here, but at UCLH, we've got a large long COVID clinic. Many of them are going to be coming to us, um, and this is going to be something that carries on. COVID-19 is not a, a gone issue. We have 20,000 new cases in the past week. This is something that is still having an impact at a community level, and it's something that we need to be aware of. So adrenal response to stimulation wasn't different in patients with persistent symptoms. But this paper came out to, um, well, I say it came out, this is a preprint of data that was widely shared on Twitter um, and by lots of long COVID support groups. And this is a paper that took a cross-sectional group of patients who had had COVID, um, it was around 260 from memory in total, um, and they looked at patients who'd had COVID who had recovered, looked at patients who had COVID who hadn't recovered, and they looked at healthy um, workers. And these um, the people undertaking this study were not endocrinologists, and that may well be something that's worth bearing in mind, but they essentially took a machine learning approach, took some blood samples and said, what is different in these patients? They found that a single one-off cortisol level taken at variable times of the day was different. Additionally, they found that ACTH at taken at variable times of the day was lower. So if we look at this graph here, um, the pink um, represents the patients with long COVID. Forgive me, I can't quite. This represents long COVID. This represents convalescent COVID, they called it, but patients are covered, and these are your healthy controls. So along the um, axis here, we've got your cortisol level, um, and we can see here we've got density, which is essentially kind of proportion of patients who have um, levels that here. And it's worth saying that 75 nanograms per mil from memory is around 185 nanomoles per litre. So at variable times of the day, they found that a lot of patients with long COVID had low cortisol levels. But I think the clinical inference for us as endocrinologists is, well, so not without, so what? So actually, are these patients collapsing? Are these patients coming in with adrenal crises? If you've got someone who's got a cortisol of 100, you might expect them to be running into difficulties. I don't know about your practice here, but certainly at UCLH, we are not seeing these large patients. Now, it's important that you hear me correctly. What I'm not saying is that this is not adrenally based. Now, whether or not these patients may have subtle perturbations in their adrenocortical status such that they have symptoms of fatigue is a question that we can't yet answer with our data. But I'd be very cautious about providing steroid treatment, for example, in these patients when we know the comorbidities associated with that. And certainly that data at the moment is lacking. Again, a cross-sectional study, I would argue, is not the best way to answer this question either. And this is a question that we need to address as clinicians because it's a question that patients are asking us. Um, and as I say, this has come with lots of excitement um, amongst the community. But I would really caution against using this to argue that there is definitely an adrenal effect um, when we think about COVID-19. Now, we've come on to talk about vaccines. And vaccines, as we've talked about, have really changed the shape of COVID-19 um, for the better. It's I was talking to someone earlier, it's very odd thinking back to those terrifying days of early 2020 and what the world looked like then. Um, but there, are, there is evidence that the COVID-19 vaccine in a similar way to the virus can have effects. But these again are on a small level. So at the moment, 12 million vaccines have been delivered worldwide and I'm sure that number is bigger um, now. And we can see these are handfuls of cases of subacute thyroiditis, handfuls of cases of Graves disease, handfuls of cases of adrenal hemorrhage. And most of these patients are presenting with something else. Again, the main message to remember though, is that doesn't mean they don't exist. So if you have a patient presenting to A&E who's hyponatremic and um, who has recently had a vaccine, think adrenals, I definitely don't want you to be hearing that message. But what I am saying is the COVID-19 vaccine seems to be safe from an endocrine perspective. And in the context of a kind of million, a kind of a vaccine that's been delivered to millions, these are small handfuls of cases. Um, so a little plug for the SFE work on steroids emergency cards. Hopefully all your patients have these emergency cards. Um, we're thinking that we give our advice for patients with known adrenal insufficiency to actually give themselves more steroids than we might otherwise do. So the current advice is 20 milligrams four times a day, which for lots of our patients will be a little bit more than that double your dose, which we often advise. 
Um, again, limited data to support that, but we know that there seems to be quite a significant pro-inflammatory pro response. So just to summarise, because I wanted to have time for questions today, and we can see that there are acute effects on the thyroid gland by COVID-19. Um, there's no effects, evidence of persistent change, however, at three months post-infection, and that's important for our long, long COVID cohort. There are case reports of adrenal gland hemorrhage and infarction. and there is new emerging data that there may well be some destruction at the level of the adrenal glands. But currently to date, there's no evidence of persistent changes or relationship to persistent symptoms. Um, vaccines are an important thing to be taking in your history when you're meeting patients in A&E and in clinic. You want to know what their vaccine status is because that may well affect your diagnosis when you're assessing patients, um, but it seems to be affecting small numbers. I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention today and I'm welcome to take any questions. Before I hand the, before I become the sort of the, the microphone carrier, can I just ask you a question? So is long COVID a purely clinical diagnosis like ME or post-viral syndrome? So that's a great question. Thank you very much. So long COVID is defined, um, again, on a lack of evidence perspective as the symptoms that persist beyond 12 weeks. And the syndrome of long COVID has been welcomed by a lot of patients within the chronic fatigue and ME um, communities because they feel that this has so many parallels with their experience and they're hoping that evidence from long COVID is translatable across the ME and chronic fatigue syndrome societies. I think what COVID-19 has done is it really has heightened our awareness as clinicians that there are a cohort of patients for whom there really are significant post-viral effects, if that makes sense. And um, what we can't yet unpick is what the underlying immunological basis of that is and whether or not there is indeed one. And that's really what that cross-sectional study was trying to address, but it's probably not the right way to do it, I would argue. I don't know if that's answered your question. Uh, thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, just a good question regarding the um, steroids for patients with adrenal insufficiency when they go for the, the vac COVID vaccine. Uh, would you advise them to double the dose or only when... We don't have any evidence for that. So I would give them normal steroid six day rules. If they have a fever, then they need to increase their doses we'd otherwise recommend. Um, so we don't have evidence for that. Hi, Sophie. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I agree. My clinic is definitely filled with the tired people and uh, who all blame it on covid and then a bit like your data no one ever has an endocrinopathy that we demonstrate what do you say to them and what do you do next great question so i tell patients i think the most important thing is their symptoms are real even if i can't explain them what i can cross off is certain important things that could be life-threatening like adrenal insufficiency that will i think a lot of patients are very anxious they get to our clinic after a long wait for a referral and what's important is to say to them this whatever it is at the moment, there's no evidence of a life-threatening endocrinopathy. Whether or not you have experienced a change in your endocrine system that may account for some of the symptoms, there's nothing here that I'm going to be able to treat with any treatments I have available. Um, and then I would probably refer them to Long COVID Clinic. Um, I would. In fact, there's an MDT that is set up for you because there's a recognition this is a, a true symptom and a syndrome, but my endocrine clinic is not the best place to see you. That would be my approach. The data you presented from Italy, um, do you think that has anything to do with um, iodine status in a population? That's a really fascinating question, actually. So thank you for that question. Um, and it could be, I mean, I think we need to really um, understand, I think one of the caveats to that data, which is important, is their cut off the thyrotoxicosis is actually quite different to ours. So looking at that data, um, I think their TSH was less than 0 0.3 with a 3T4 of 17 or above was thyrotoxicosis. And that was probably a little bit less stringent than what we would buy here, depending on your assay. I think iodine status so could well account for it. Um, I don't think we have the answer, is the, the kind of true answer to why our data was so different. But smaller numbers in that study compared to ours as well. We were surprised, I think, though, as well, similarly. Sophie, thank you so thank much. You much. You've given us lots to think about. More questions over lunch, I'm sure. And now it's a pleasure to introduce Amy DiMarco, who's very much on home territory. After a physician, you have to have a surgeon talking about COVID. Delighted. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you. Um, so I would ordinarily extend um, a debt of thanks to Fausto, to the organising committee, for asking me to give a talk here until I saw the title. So COVID is, as Sophie has already said so beautifully in her talk, something that most of us would rather put behind us if at all possible. Um, 
And alongside that, I've been invited to give a talk after some really incredibly uh, eminent speakers. So Sophie, I'm not going to touch your incredible basic sciences there. Sanjay, although he's left, I'm not going to get patched on the sexiness of his surgical talk. Um, what I'm going to do is really tell a story. So the story of endocrine surgery in COVID is just that. It's a sequence of events through which we found ourselves thrown into, as we all did, a very difficult situation, and we needed to work out how to continue treating all of our patients in that context. So um, I'm afraid I'm going to give you a bit of revision of these stages of the pandemic, because what happened is that as the pandemic was recognised as such, and as it developed, so too did our understanding uh, of the medical and surgical issues that these patients were going to face. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, endocrine surgery in COVID in terms of the phases that we went through. Uh, and then I'll have a look at whether what we did was appropriate and how we assessed it. Uh, then start to think about which of those changes we should try and retain uh, and what we might learn for the next time that this uh, may happen. Uh, like Sophie, apologies, because I know that none of you will have had a pleasant experience of COVID, but some possibly more so than others. Um, I'm showing that I am right up to date here because the medical school recently told us all that if we're delivering a lecture which may have any kind of upsetting content, we need a trigger warning. So there it is. So I said I'd start with a timeline um, and you will all recall that it was actually the end of 2019, the first human case of what we now know to be COVID-19 uh, was described in Wuhan. Uh, the FCO of the UK uh, was, was relatively speedy to react and advised against all but essential travel to Wuhan. Uh, and subsequently, the WHO a week after that declared this to be a public health emergency of international concern. Then the spread began towards the European direction. And by the end of January, there was a case described in Italy, which we believe to be the first case in Italy of a Chinese national. And subsequently after that, um, further clusters of cases were seen throughout Italy. And this coincided with people still uh, undergoing travel for their February half terms. And how did that relate to the UK? Well, this is exhibit A. February 2020, the Italian Alps. Need I say more? I said I'd get you for inviting me to give this talk. And that is what happened <laughs> later. He returns to the Hammersmith Hospital laden with virus. Um, so I jest actually, because um, we are told that about the same time that the first cases were seen in Italy, uh, they were also being reported in the UK, in York. So much as we'd like to blame Fausto, we cannot. Um, and this timeline tracks the cases as they started to rise exponentially from that alleged one in York through to nine, uh, 10 days later, 36 cases by the 1st of March, and things were really gathering pace by the time we had the first death also uh, at the beginning of March, at which point the WHO then declared this to be a pandemic. Coming back to what was going on in the UK at that time and the struggles that we had in trying to continue to provide any kind of medical service, Boris had declared the work from home on the 16th of March. Uh, and then some new troubles started. We had our first webinar on the 18th of March. Now, at the time, I cannot describe to you how exciting this was. I remember sitting in the operating theatre, having just finished some cases, and thinking I'm going to dial onto this webinar and listen to surgeons uh, and anaesthetists from Italy tell us what to do when this virus really comes to town. And it was really exciting. But of course, all of our subsequent experience of webinars um, may be uh, somewhat marred by the fact that they also explode in the same way as the pandemic. Um, so we were still able to continue with uh, truly elective operating up until that point and right up until the point when the national lockdown began. Um, so our last operating list here at the Hammersmith was just three days before the lockdown occurred. Um, and as you will all remember at that point, we, were, we just had a little uh, peak in cases before uh, the lockdown brought them down a fraction. But we were all aware from the data coming out of Italy that we were on the precipice of something uh, really dreadful. And so 
The first stage of responding to this in a surgical perspective began, which I would refer to as preservation of services. Uh, and by that, I mean that obviously all of us had to start to think not just about our own uh, practices, but about the wider picture and how we may assist with that. So from an NHS perspective, in a resource-strapped environment, we had to focus uh, purely on uh, the delivery of emergency services and on losing, inevitably, some of our resources to that. Uh, but it was already obvious that this uh, pandemic was going to be with us for the foreseeable. And so while we were rationalising our outpatients and switching towards virtual consultations, we couldn't switch them off altogether. However, at this point, elective surgery was essentially entirely cancelled and postponed. And because, as you will see, very little endocrine surgery falls within the category of life-saving emergency surgery, uh, we were essentially switched off at this point in time. Um, alongside that, we had some retraining uh, of our staff members, which was very important here. For those of you that don't recognise him, you will see uh, the illustrious Professor Neil Tolley uh, volunteering to assist with proning training. And that's about pretty much what we were good for at this stage. Um, us and the orthopaedic surgeons were invited to the ICU to perform these very basic tasks. Um, a process of data gathering, as you all know, was continuing apace, and we were starting to establish through webinars and through the data that came out of uh, other countries affected what the true mortality of this was, and we thought around 10% at that stage, what the multiple different pharmacological treatment options were, what the most appropriate um, respiratory support measures were and also we were starting to understand that some of the even more minor procedures that we undertook would routinely could present a danger to the healthcare workers associated uh, and this is now a term that we use very widely but did not at the time so aerosol generating procedures we started to define them uh, and to minimize them uh, we also started to gather data on the safety of general anaesthesia in patients with COVID and also the impact on clinicians. And uh, I would put a very serious point up here, and this was something that really brought home to us uh, the magnitude of what we were dealing with uh, when some of the first uh, UK physicians, surgeons, uh, sadly passed away through this pandemic. Uh, and in particular, this surgeon who was an ENT surgeon with an interest in thyroid surgery uh, and who was clearly a fantastically gifted and wonderful person and who died around that time just as we were starting to plan our response. So this is phase two then, the planning phase. So we needed to establish how we were going to continue some kind of elective practice, how we were going to select cases, uh, how we would conduct an MDT, and then assuming that we were going to operate on patients, how we would do that. So it was clear that patients needed to be clean from a COVID perspective and therefore they would need some sort of isolation screening uh, and that the safest way to prevent them from coming into contact with other patients who had COVID and were being treated for that in the hospital was either by um, inventing new so-called clean pathways within our hospitals or taking them to other locations altogether. I'll also say a short word about laparoscopy because there was concern raised about the safety of that as an AGP itself uh, in the early part of the pandemic. And then, although I did say that all we were good for in ITU was the simple manual orthopedic type tasks such as proning, I will say uh, a short word about the, the tasks which we did fulfill such as um, providing a tracheostomy service to the ITU and how that presented its own challenges. It could be a whole presentation itself with regard to appropriate case selection, the excitement of the PPE, and establishing a standard operating procedure, which we in the ICUs could all follow. So case selection, how did we do that? Well, um, the prioritization was uh, done globally across all of surgery. Um, and this is not new, that a 1A categorization would be a patient who needs their surgery for life-saving purposes uh, to be performed within the course of 24 hours, uh, 1B within 72 hours, and then priority 2 within a month, priority 3 within 3 months, and priority 4 beyond 3 months. So that was... Uh, 
prioritization that started to be applied to all surgical specialties and it generated the need for each specialty uh, to consider how their standard pathologies would fall into those uh, four basic categories. So both the British Association of Endocrine Thyroid Surgeons, the American Association, the Italians all came up with very similar guidance um, for thyroid, parathyroid and adrenal patients, which is that there were very few um, emergencies that could truly be classified as uh, one, I was only one, and that was a patient with uh, a truly acute airway arising only from their thyroid pathology. But beyond that, most other pathologies were going to fall into category two. So large non-malignant goiters causing mild to moderate stridor, aggressive cancers, and by that I mean uh, those which are poorly or undifferentiated, medullary or with metastatic disease at presentation, uncontrolled thyrotoxicosis, or uncontrolled graves specifically uh, in the context of pregnancy or unsuitability for medical therapy uh, and patients with site-threatening graves eye disease. So that's all pretty straightforward. Everything else, including uh, lobectomy uh, for indeterminate thyroid nodules fell into priority three, i.e. within three months and everything else beyond three months. Um, with regard to categorization of parathyroids, that was as you would expect. Those with severe biochemistry, suspected carcinoma, repeated admissions, or pregnant women, or those with deteriorating renal function, all came as P2s, i.e. need to be done within the course of a month. Um, those with other reasons for needing their surgery more urgently, i.e. recurrent uh, renal stones or sepsis, fell into a P3, and everybody else into P4, you get the gist. And the same was true uh, in the adrenals. So very large masses, known malignant masses or refractory medical problems would fall into a P2 within a month. Uh, most other things into P3 and then our, our smaller lesions and non-functional work into P4. So we then uh, had to go through a process of looking at our waiting lists and working out how to categorize our patients into those. Uh, in order to know who we should be operating on in the first part of the pandemic. And as I say, the Americans, the Italians, everybody else did the same thing. Now, I mentioned the fact that it was already known that general anesthesia in the context of COVID was not advantageous. Uh, and although this paper was published relatively late on, this came out in 2021, so well after we'd had to recognize this fact, um, there were already plenty of um, examples of cases where patients with COVID had had an anaesthetic and subsequently ended up on ITU as a result of that. Um, but putting some numbers to that in terms of when we were then looking after patients who had had COVID and recovered, when could we safely uh, offer them surgery? Uh, the 30-day mortality following a general anaesthetic for any procedure endocrine or otherwise uh, was elevated uh, over threefold if they had surgery at naught to two weeks, 3.2 times surgery for five to six weeks, and then it fell gradually uh, by the time surgery was beyond six weeks. Hence, the recommendation was subsequently made that seven weeks was a kind of magic number for safely operating on people, at which point um, their risk could fall into that of the general population. So, um, and now we're worried about how, when we've got our prioritised patients, we've got an agreement that they can undergo general anaesthesia as long as they either don't have COVID or they're more than a certain amount of time out from their COVID, how we provide the care in a, a safe manner. Now, I appreciate that um, for those who practice outside of London, they might feel a sense of rising nausea on looking at this slide because we were so phenomenally lucky uh, to be able to use the capacity within our private hospitals, which were now not undertaking any elective work whatsoever, and who welcomed us in to look after our NHS patients uh, in completely clean hospitals. So we no longer had to worry about the idea that our patients would need a clean corridor through a hospital which was otherwise full of COVID patients. As long as all the patients were screened and the staff were undertaking their screening as well, we were safe from here. So we're very grateful to those institutions which supported endocrine surgery. And although all of the private hospitals throughout London played some role, these were the two in which um, Neil, Fausto and I and the rest of the team uh, resided throughout parts of COVID. So I said I'd uh, go on to speak about how we assessed the patients. There was a lot of telephoning to do here, both from clinician's perspective, from the endocrinologist's perspective, and surgical's perspective, 
uh, but also nursing to make sure that uh, the patients were appropriately ready, isolated, screened, etc. Um, so this is the information that our patients were given when they were told they were going to be uh, looked after in one of these uh, institutions operating, offering COVID-free care for their operation. They had a phone assessment, they were told to self-isolate, and they were either told to self-isolate for seven days for a non-GA procedure or for us, all of our patients, for 14 days initially. And they all had to come in and have a supervised PCR test in the hospital car park at a special pod uh, that was just out the back of the renal building. Uh, and that was actually very successful. So uh, now we'll just digress a little bit into laparoscopy because for us, obviously, this was the mainstay of uh, the method by which we would treat our adrenal patients. And we were being told because of this paper and a few others that it wasn't safe to do. And, and the reason that we were being told is because there was uh, some empirical data and observational data that healthcare workers standing in the same room as patients having laparoscopy where the patient themselves was then found to have COVID, the healthcare workers had a very high chance of contracting COVID. And it was thought that the plume of gas coming from the patient's abdomen when a port was vented and the CO2 pressure was therefore being released into the atmosphere was effectively aerosolizing COVID to the healthcare workers. And so laparoscopy was switched off for a brief period of time and this helpful advice that laparoscopy should be undertaken only by an experienced surgeon not sure when that wouldn't have been the case in a, in a pandemic but anyway it was given fortunately industry did somewhat come to our rescue with um, improved filters on the laparoscopic machines um, and advice on how we could use specific uh, pneumoperitoneum machines which would generate a lower pressure within the abdomen and therefore uh, putatively aerosolize less COVID. So although we didn't do laparoscopy and actually therefore did very little adrenal surgery in the very first part of the pandemic, once we knew it was safe to do so, we could proceed. Any excuse to put up another funny photo of my colleagues. So alongside this, I mentioned we did the tracheostomy service. So the reason we needed a standard operating procedure is kind of intrinsically linked to the PPE. So it's funny to think about it now, but we were being told obviously that these were highly aerosolizing procedures. We had the example of the death of a colleague ENT surgeon and not long prior, and we were going to be operating on patients who were specifically in the ITU with COVID and very unwell. So we had a reasonable um, reason to suspect that there may be a lot of COVID particles flying around. And we were concerned about this and the other team members who would be in that environment. So we needed to protect ourselves to minimize the team in theater and to get this done in a safe and effective way. So the best way of doing that was to put on your scrubs, step into one of those lovely hazmat suits that you will all have had on the COVID wards as well. Um, put on, I think, were you wearing the bright mask there? Initially, we had to wear the FFP3 mask or an N95 mask under the, the hat. Then we put on the hat, so this is a positive pressure generating, uh, well it's a helmet attached to a tube out the back, which has a positive pressure device on it that you wear on your belt. So you're having air forced, that's drawn out of the environment, filtered, and then blasted through your helmet. So you are only, um, you are only able to entrain air into your helmet and inhale air that has been filtered by the device uh, on your belt. So, You've got that hat on and then you put on your sterile gown and sterile gloves, at which point you can see very little and you can hear nothing, absolutely nothing except the whirring of a fan in your ears and your temperature is rising. Now, um, many of you will have been involved in tracheostomies over the years, but unfortunately in this setting, communication is vital because the patient has a tube in their mouth you make a hole in their trachea, and then you have, the, have to ask the anaesthetist to gently pull back the tube as you insert your tube so that the patient is not rendered anoxic for too long. And you have to do all of that, able only to hear the noise of a fan in your ears. So we needed an SOP so that ourselves and the anaesthetist could really understand what was going on. And so this image is actually, uh, because we didn't have phones to take photos uh, during these procedures in real time. This is Fausto uh, undergoing training, and that is a model, as you will spot, they've got no lower half of their body. 
So I mentioned the period of anoxia which occurs as the ET tube is withdrawn and the tracheostomy tube is inserted. So that educated case selection. So you've got to choose a patient uh, who has, is able to withstand or expected to be able to withstand a short period of anoxia. Um, and uh, so we relied on the SOP to dictate that to ICU who selected the patients and sent them to us. And then I've uh, mentioned organization. So because of the heavy amount of PPE and because of the the difficulty in coordinating this stuff, we tried to batch these cases together. And the idea is that we would sit in the operating theatre and the IC would wheel the patients in, we would tracheostomize them, they would leave through the exit, and we would carry on in that manner. And we were also really interested to know um, how truly virally loaded and how aerosol generating these procedures were. So we were taking lots of samples at the time to see what the answer was. And so we entered the new normal. So we were doing our elective operating, um, mostly as a team of consultants at that stage, because our juniors, poor things, had been reallocated to other aspects of COVID care. Our tracky service was continuing. Our virtual clinics um, alongside the endocrinologists were continuing mainly in a virtual capacity, although with some face-to-face -face two-week weight clinics, in which I saw a lot of people with painful necks and, uh, and thyroiditis who clearly had COVID. Um, our MDTs went all virtual and they were essential, as everybody has said in our practice, we could not dispense with those. The webinars became unstoppable, the clapping for carers became embarrassing, the WhatsApp didn't stop going. Um, so we did, so this is a slide to put up just to point out that it, it became a greater team effort as things progressed. So while we were operating as a team of three consultants initially, we were then able to draw our juniors back from their, their various reallocations. And um, so we've got two of our registrars uh, and one of our ex-fellows there, Klaas Land and Hader. Um, so in terms of assessing what we did and what happened, um, I'm gonna talk uh, just about a small number of things. So one is a multi-center uh, perspective project that we conducted here at Imperial. The other is some data from the States about disease progression or otherwise in endocrine surgery, and then I'll just update you on what we found with regard to our tracking. So in terms of the service that we provided between the three of us over the six months from March to end of September, we operated on 167 endocrine surgical cases, 79 parathyroids, 73 thyroids, and 15 adrenals, all of which were towards the end of that period. And you will say, well, hang on a minute, weren't you only meant to be operating on parathyroids with a calcium of over three? And weren't you only meant to be operating on the kind of priority two patients initially? And that's true. But of course, once we had the standard pathways set up, we knew that they were safe. We had no adverse outcomes from the first few patients that went through. We realized that we needed to continue looking after patients on our waiting list and the new patients coming through. And we were therefore able to extend the criteria to offer surgery to the patients with P3 pathology. And towards the very end of this, it's possible that some uh, one or two kind of P4 plus patients slip through. So in terms of whether that was the right thing to do, we had no mortality from our patients. We had no ICU admissions uh, at all, including obviously as a result of COVID. Um, we looked at our standard data, which is obviously available on the UK RETS uh, website. And we had two vocal cord palsies throughout that time period uh, and three failures to cure primary hyperpara. So these were kind of in line with our, our standard figures outside of a pandemic. Uh, although interesting to see not improve by having three of us in the room together. Um, so as I said, we um, also commenced a project. So Klaas, who you saw in the last slide, our fellow commenced a multi-centre project as part of the COVID surge predict study that Sanjay also mentioned, but looking specifically at the endocrine surgical patients. So we extended an open invitation to any endocrine centre anyone who was performing any kind of endocrine surgery throughout the pandemic to submit their cases. And we ended up with 380 across 19 centers in 12 countries. So quite a nice mix, although with an obvious bias towards those that were interested in those who were actually doing endocrine surgery at the time. Um, we found some really surprising things. So only two thirds of the patients in the study were told to self-isolate or said they've been told to self-isolate prior to surgery. 
And only 70% seemed to have a definite known COVID status pre-op, which sounded quite worrying to us. And these were definitely patients not operated on within our institution. But interestingly, despite that, there was only one planned ICU admission due to COVID in this 380 cohort study. So that was interesting in itself and reassured us about the safety of what we had done and were doing. Uh, on the negative side, we saw a huge uptick in consultant delivered care for obvious reasons, particularly in anaesthesia, where all of their juniors were working hard on the ITU and COVID wards. Uh, and it also affected our trainees uh, in the first part of this in particular. Uh, going back to the aerosol generating procedures, obviously our standard practice would be that all our patients get an endoscopic vocal cord check pre and post thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And that just fell off a cliff because we weren't able to offer uh, post-operative vocal cord checks in a safe environment. We were able to do it pre-op just prior to surgery because we knew that the patients were screened and COVID negative when we put the tube into their nose. So um, this is a busy slide, but the, the numbers to note are the single, and this is from the whole 380 patient study, the single COVID related unplanned uh, ICU admission one uh, and the complications, which even though this was across a much wider group of hospitals were still pretty low. So a vocal cord palsy rate of less than 1%, which is pretty good a hypopara rate, and this is short-term follow-up data, not long-term, in the thyroid patients of 12%, failure to cure of 5%. Um, so these were good um, and reassured us again that our practice was safe. But what about patients who did have delays? Because even though we were able to treat a majority of our patients, it was inevitably the case that that wasn't in the, the timely manner that they might otherwise have experienced. Well, um, this American group looked at this and made some quite interesting observations. So their median uh, delayed treatment was actually only 70 days. And I think that we really need that in order to contextualize the results of their studies because they found that overall 4% of their patients uh, that's thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal, although there's only thyroid and parathyroid on this slide, 4% showed some kind of escalation in the severity of their pathology, either in terms of size, metastatic disease, or biochemical severity in that median 70 days weighted to surgery. Um, from that, because it was a small number of patients and it did not associate um, them with a worse outcome or a change in the operative plan, they concluded that it was perfectly fine to delay patients and in a future pandemic, that's what they would do. I would actually interpret it slightly differently and say that's only 70 days. That's a very short period of time. And to say that in 70 days, your papillary thyroid carcinomas are progressing and metastasizing uh, is quite concerning, if indeed it's correct. So I wouldn't choose to use this data to support delaying patients in the future. So what happened with the virology tracheostomy data? We had 37 patients going through, all were swab tested. Uh, all of the equipment that we were using that was exposed to the patient was swab tested for PCR. Uh, and then the window of trachea, which was excised at the point where the uh, tube was put into the patient's trachea, was sent off uh, for culture for COVID and their plasma neutralization antibodies were checked. And the results were very interesting. So there were only nine positive PCR results from the 37 patients. The tissue culture was all negative though, uh, and all the patients had a good titer of neutralizing antibodies. Now, um, I didn't say in the patient selection, but obviously these were patients that had already been intubated on ITU for a time, a minimum of 10 days. And so the presumption was essentially that they had uh, cleared their viral load by that point uh, and were safe to operate on. So in a future pandemic, we may not need or use the same level of PPE. Um, <clears throat> so that took us past the peak and towards the slump and the plan for recovery and the repatriation of our services from uh, clean hospitals to clean pathways. And we were so fortunate that Imperial provided us with these um, fantastic mechanisms for preventing COVID crossing between COVID positive patients and clean pathway patients. Um, that was really great. Um, but essentially we took um, all of the processes and pathways that we've been using in the other locations and applied them to our patients as they came back into the hospital. So um, I've reached the end. Which of the changes which occurred during COVID? This should be a mentee. Uh, because there, there are definite questions about some of these. 
uh, have remained and should remain. So risk assessment has remained um, a priority and will do. I think that we all now look at our patients in a slightly different uh, light when listing them for surgery, knowing uh, some of the fallout from uh, COVID and the effect it had on comorbid patients. Prioritisation was probably quite useful, although we're now beaten with a stick if we haven't appropriately prioritised our patients at a point where we put them on the waiting list. We now need to categorise them at the time of listing into P2, 3 or 4, essentially. Um, the virtual working, well, that's one for the mentee. It had pros and cons. Um, I think it has been helpful, particularly for making our MDTs more practical. Um, but the face-to-face -face environment is without compare. The collaboration, both obviously within our MDT and then to the wider community, to the hospitals that hosted us, was something that I think we should hang on to. And I've put waiting lists there because these were a problem before the pandemic. They've become more of a problem in most trusts after the pandemic. They're not changes that we should hang on to, but they're something that we need to be aware of. And therefore, if put in this situation, again, I think we've probably learned that we need to somehow to continue doing so-called elective work because everything that's P4 to start with becomes P3 and then P2 when you leave it long enough. And with that, this was actually for the last talk of the afternoon, this slide, I hope you'll like it. Uh, I'll take any questions. Does anyone get it? No one? No? It's beginning to feel a lot like nobody laughs. Isthmus. Well, Amy, thank you for that. My goodness. Uh, most of the people in the room are physicians and we feel humbled to see our colleagues doing such heroic work while we were on the telephone. My goodness. Uh, questions for Amy? or comments, or adulation, or <laughs> David. Thanks, Amy. Really enjoyed it. And I'm now going to expose my ignorance. But I've always thought that COVID was a respiratory disease with spread by breathing and coughing. And that the systemic illness was a consequence of the inflammatory response, not blood-borne viruses. So I always thought it was ridiculous that laparoscopic surgery could have been unsafe. Am I wide of the mark? No, you're not. I think it just took some time for everybody to agree that that was, in fact, the correct and common sense approach to it. So um, when those cases that had happened whereby a COVID positive patient had been operated on, I think there were some examples of lap appendixes being carried out and the patients found to be COVID positive and everybody in the room was infected. I think two things had happened. One, there was surprise about um, how truly infectious the aerosol generating procedure of the intubation had been. Uh, uh, and I didn't touch on that, but we had to go through various protocols whenever a patient was anaesthetized, but essentially nobody was in the room except for the anaesthetist patient. So one, there was surprise about the infectious nature of it and therefore a desire to look elsewhere for an explanation. And the other was a lack of understanding about whether there may be COVID uh, on the peritoneum that was aerosolized. You're quite correct, we then found that not the case, but in the meantime, the drug companies had sold lots of the air seal device. <laughs> I just wondered um, when you saw when you did list patients for surgery or saw them in clinic. There was a very much a virtual clinic consultation situation going on. Did you find it, and did it have any impact? Do you think on the surgical outcome or the patient You know, the rapport you had with the patient that sometimes the first time you were actually meeting them was when you were giving, when you were consenting them for an operation. Um, and had actually never seen them face to face, you've just done a virtual appointment. Do you think that had any impact in the long term outcome or um, how you felt about the operation or any long term effects? Um, thank you, Jeannie. That's a really, really excellent point. And it's one that um, concerned us a lot and I've kind of glossed over during the presentation. Uh, but yes, it was very difficult. Uh, a lot of the patients who we were operating on, we had met at least once previously because they were kind of coming through the waiting list. But for the new patients, while we were able to meet some of them face to face, uh, we were unable to meet all of them face to face. And it was 
quite concerning to be meeting them for the first time on the day of surgery. Fortunately, we would have had uh, the ability to communicate with them somehow. One thing that we just couldn't compensate for with any number of phone calls or Zoom consultations uh, or clinic.co was the loss of their relatives in the process though. Um, and that demanded a, a whole lot of extra work in order to bring them into the process subsequently so that we didn't then end up with this quiet and differing expectation. But um, we would definitely not want to lose our face-to-face -face clinics for exactly that reason. Thank you. Amy, thank you so much for that. And from one surgical colleague to another, it's a great pleasure to have David Scott Coombs with us today, as always, every time we have this meeting. And today he's going to enlighten us on pet incidental omers. Gosh, this is close to our heart. We need to hear this. Thank you very much, David. Okay, thanks, James. Um, so we'll crack off as hypoglycemia uh, rapidly approaches with some questions, just three. Uh, and this is just to see whether or not it was worth me traveling here uh, and talking about this. So the first question is, when a PET scan identifies focal thyroid uptake, okay, as opposed to diffuse, what is the likelihood that it is a cancer? A choice of 100%, 60%, or 30%. Give them all 10 seconds on everybody. Quicker you vote, quicker you eat. Okay, so a clear majority for 30%. The next question, what is the best investigation to make a diagnosis of thyroid cancer of the choices you're given? Is it PET scan, ultrasound scan, fine needle aspiration biopsy, core biopsy? Okay, so uh, clearly a bias towards um, cytology or histology and away from ultrasound and not for PET. Okay, and the final question, which has been badly stemmed, so I will clarify it. For patients with a thyroid cancer that was diagnosed by the PET scan, what is the mortality disease specific, in other words, the thyroid cancer disease mortality at three years. A PET scan diagnosed primary thyroid cancer. What is the thyroid cancer mortality at three years? Not two, 10, 30, or 70%. Okay, and again, clear majority you see there. So in fact, one could argue that I can now go back to Cardiff because the majority got the, res the answers right most of the time. But I think I still have a role because the question is, why am I being referred all of these patients all of the time? And I hope in, 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 in the short period now to uh, persuade everyone in MDTs to do less, something we were talking about a bit earlier. So I'd just like to first of all start by thanking um, Professor Palazzo and Professor uh, Mirren for a very kind invitation. Clearly, uh, Fausto is suffering with long COVID because that invitation did slip through again. And more than that, I actually got to have a, a, a bit of an insight, sorry, a bit of an input into uh, the title of the talk, because this is something that I'm getting very interested in, because it's annoying me a lot, and it's increasing uh, the time I'm spending looking at wretched scans. So a bit of quick background, uh, PET scans detect photon emission as a consequence of radioactive substances being injected into the body. Um, and the commonest substrate used is FDG, 
uh, which is an analogue of glucose and detects tissues that have high glucose consumption. And nearly a hundred years ago, the Nobel Prize physicist uh, Otto uh, Warburg, he identified that malignant tumours consume tremendous amounts of glucose compared with non-transformed tissues. And so PET scans have been really good uh, and perhaps the imaging modality in diagnosing and staging thyroid cancer. But it's not all about cancer. PET scans, and you see here and you will know from your education that it's used in neurology, uh, a lot of stuff about dementia because uh, we can identify amyloid, which is in the press yesterday, in infection, uh, occasionally for investigations of PUO, um, but it's mainly used, used in the oncological sphere. And if we look at the uh, work of um, our fantastic academic PET unit in Cardiff, in the last 12 years, nearly 22,000 scans. And if we take out the um, prostate-specific membrane antigen scans and the dementia scans, because that just looks at the brain uh, and misses out the thyroid, you'll see that of nearly 21,000 scans, only 360 were requested for non-oncologic indications. Uh, and the commonest ones being shown there. So the normal thyroid is, does not, glucose is not the normal driver uh, um, of metabolism in the thyroid. So in a PET scan, uh, as shown here with some nasty malignancy down there, a normal thyroid is not seen. Okay. Um, now there are changes in the metabolism in uh, hurtle cell uh, um, tumors, both benign and malignant, and in follicular adenoma and carcinoma, such that they do um, switch and use glucose as their main substrate. This is a definition in a fantastic paper, which I will come back to a bit later, uh, uh, of what a thyroid incidentaloma is. It's an unexpected thyroid lesion fortuitously uh, maybe that's a positive spin, detected on radiological scans performed for non-thyroid disease, okay? And these are, as you know, uh, the, the um, incidences, if you like, of PET, sorry, of radiological incidentalomas in non-PET imaging. So we know that the older the population uh, and the more um, female gender, you know, the high rates of, of incidental thyroid nodules seen if we just ultrasound scan everyone in Tesco's. And you see correspondingly a fewer in the CTs and the cross-sectional MRIs, um, but still quite a high number. Okay, so we know that thyroid incidentaloma is a pain as it is with uh, adrenal, but that's only what, 6% of scans. And the rate of malignancy in non-PET thyroid incidentaloma is pretty much the same as the rate of malignancy of someone turning up to your clinic uh, with, a, with a thyroid nodule, uh, where I would say the malignancy is probably more towards the 4% end, end of that range. In, contra okay, in, in PET scanning, all right, there are two types of patterns of avidity. There is the diffuse, which is seen in nodular hyperplasia and in thyroiditis, including both Graves and Hashimoto's. Ma malignancy is not in the differential diagnosis of a diffuse uptake. In focal uptake, the differential diagnosis is shown here, both benign follicular and hurtle cell adenoma, primary thyroid cancers, all of them, all right, papillary, follicular, medullary, um, anaplastic, and lymphoma, and rarely metastasis, okay? And in contradistinction to um, non-PET thyroid incidentalomas, radiologically found, um, there is quite a lot of consistency in the literature, all right? First of all, it's seen in about 3% of all PET scans, of which 2% of all PET scans have focal uptake. And of them, 30% are malignant, which most of you knew, and of them, 80% are papillary thyroid cancer. And this will be uh, uh, um, 
repeated as we look at some of the studies. Just a quick word about thyroid, sorry, metastases to the thyroid. Okay, and here is an example of a patient with squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck with a metastasis to the upper pole of the right thyroid lobe. Well, the literature on metastases to the thyroid is quite scant. Uh, Faust has actually published a case report in series review, as has Ian Nixon in Edinburgh, but the best series, the biggest series, is from the Mayo Clinic um, over a 30-year period, and you can see how rare solitary, presumed solitary isolated metastases to the thyroid are, where the average tumor size is really quite chunky, okay, and the median survival was 20 months. But these are a poor prognostic group. If the patients were operated on and had a hemithyroidectomy, then that median survival shifted to 30 months, okay, so 10 months survival did not reach statistical significance but it might be clinically significant. And we think about the hundreds of thousands of pounds spent on some chemotherapy, which will gain 10 months survival. You know, there is a debate about whether it's of value to perform surgery for patients with thyroid metastasis, and it should be on a case-based basis. So we've got a, a scanner that detects cancer and we've got incidental thyroid nodules, and the ones we want to know about are the thyroid cancers. So can the PET scan itself identify those patients who have thyroid cancer compared to those with uh, follicular adenoma and Hertel cell adenoma? And so the, there's been a huge amount of work on this. This is a summary of meta-analysis, okay? Um, and essentially, it's looking at the standardized uptake value, the SUV, which, if you like, is a surrogate marker of the avidity um, um, of the, the uh, tumorous cells to the, the um, FDG. And the bottom line is that SUV is unable to predict who has cancer. So the irony is that the cancer detecting scanner can't actually work out in thyroid nodules, which are benign and which are malignant. So for me, the investigation of choice of a thyroid nodule is finally laspiration biopsy. By the way, the, um, the conglomerate of pathologists in endocrine pathology uh, are very much against core biopsy. So um, in that question, it's clearly FNA is the investigation of choice. This is looking at um, two papers, one from uh, endocrine recently, looking at the results of FNA in patients with PET thyroid incidentalomas compared with just a random paper I picked of just standard normal um, FNA results you'd expect in a thyroid clinic. It's using the Bethesda system, which as you know, is the American system, slightly different to Thai's system where we're one to five, they're one to six, we're three A, three B, well, they make that three and four. So our Thai four is Bethesda five, our Thai five is Bethesda six, okay? And what you see in that bar chart and on the, on the figures here is there is a shift to the right. We're seeing more malignancy, which is what we would expect compared to a normal thyroid clinic. It's the difference between the rate of malignancy in PET, which is 30%, and the rate of malignancy in all the others, which is nearer to 4 to 10%. Okay? But the key thing is, it's indeterminate in a quarter of the patients, which are either Thigh 1, Thigh 3, or Thigh 4, because obviously 3F cannot distinguish between benign and malignant. So we've got this situation where patients are anxious about what's wrong with them. And in a quarter of the investigation, the investigation of choice, it's still not moving us on, okay? Where ultimately we might have to then go on and do diagnostic surgery. So can we use ultrasound to help us target those patients who would best be having an FNA? This is a Swiss study. Um, it's using the uh, EU TIRAD score, um, which is, uh, I can't remember the acronym, but it, it, it's, it's, it's looking at various criteria and come up with a score. 
okay? And you can see that the greater the score, the greater the likelihood of malignancy. And in this fantastic center, they got very good results. The ultrasound was, ex was able to helpfully uh, identify those patients with thyroid malignancy. But the question is, does this translate to standard practice outside an expert unit in Switzerland? So I didn't know about this health warning uh, that we had to give people, but I actually had one anyway, okay? Because this is uh, Sophie, a fourth year medical student at Cardiff, daughter of a GP, daughter of a dentist, uh, who uh, four, five weeks ago, uh, someone spotted she had a lump in her thyroid, okay? She uh, goes to have a scan in the nearby private hospital. She's um, uh, scanned by uh, an experienced consultant, 12 years, highly well-trained in Oxford, uh, and, and a, a seriously big um, practitioner, very busy practitioner in head and neck ultrasound. And she's clearly saying that this is well-defined and it's benign. Um, she's actually put the dreaded U2. Okay, so according to British Thyroid Association guidelines, that patient can be reassured and discharged. Um, but she knows my cynicism, so she said, send her to me. So we do finally laspiration biopsy, and of course, it comes back as papillary thyroid cancer. So I am very cynical about the ability of ultrasound to distinguish benign and malignant. It has high... Uh, specificity, but low sensitivity, even in really talented ultrasonographers. So what guidelines are there out there? Well, Fausto was the lead author on a paper, which is actually getting quite old when PET was, was not nearly as, as um, demanded as it is now, um, but it was looking at all incidentaloma. Uh, we believe we set out to have a pragmatic, um, uh, approach to how we uh, investigate patients based on really low level evidence. It's all about expert opinion, okay? And we pragmatically said, it's less than five millimeters in diameter on ultrasound, ignore it. Between five and 10, we, 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 we went a bit nervously and we said, we'll just rescan in 12 months. We didn't actually say what you do after that. And if it's more than 10 millimeters, do fine needle aspiration biopsy. And move on to, uh, 2015, which is getting quite old, but it's still the latest iteration of what I think is our Bible, the American Thyroid Association guidelines on the investigation and management of patients with nodules and thyroid cancer. And you read there that if you've got focal FDG PET and the ultrasound shows that it's a nodule, um, and if it's more than 10 millimeters, you should do an FNA. Okay, so what has happened since 2015? So I just want to quickly canter through three studies looking at PET thyroid incidentaloma. The first from Melbourne, uh, where their starting point was to look at all the reports of the PET scans, okay? So 45,000 plus PET scans, of whom 1% in this series had thyroid incidentalomas, and then they just focused on 362 of those patients who either died or had a follow-up that exceeded 12 months, okay? They ignored two-thirds. So somewhere along the line, the MDT said, well, the reason why the PET was done in the first place was for malignancy. That patient's prognosis is so bad, we'll just ignore it. But in one-third, they did a biopsy, you go figure, 30% of thyroid cancer, and um, uh, at least 80% were, were pillory. And at the completion of the study, 98% of those patients with thyroid cancer, the thyroid cancer was stable. But a median follow-up of 24 months, two years, half of the patients were dead. So this is a highly morbid population of patients. That's why they're having the PET scan, okay? Um, most of them died of their primary malignancy. The rest of non-cancer related causes and one patient died from thyroid cancer, which was medullary thyroid cancer. 
Okay, so their, their summary is that this is a highly morbid population where in two thirds the thyroid incidental loma was ignored. They, they um, reiterated that SUV was useless in finding out the patients who had thyroid cancer. Um, they pointed out that PET is very good at identifying um, metastases associated with papillary thyroid cancer in the cervical nodes. Okay. And the predictors of death were, first of all, the avidity of the primary cancer. So if, if you have a very high SUV in your primary cancer, lung, colon, whatever, then actually is itself a poor prognostic factor. And clearly advanced stage, and funnily enough, teleologically, the decision not to investigate the thyroid incidental loma was validated by the fact that they had a poor prognosis. Next study, we're still trying to get published, but we presented it at the BAETS in Leeds. We actually started at the other end. We looked at patients who got to the thyroid surgery MDT. And in Oxford, they actually kept data on the patients who had surveillance. In Cardiff, we only kept data on the patients who had surgery. So they'd been through all those filters. They'd been referred by the MDT, hadn't been ignored. They'd had biopsies and then we'd gone on and operated uh, similar um, age and gender in each patient. Um, the indication for the PET scan, well, it's not really fair this because what, they were all probably for suspicion of cancer, but we then found out that the, that the lung nodule was benign. Okay. But the bottom line is, Obviously, we only operated on people who had Thy 3F or 4 or 5. We didn't operate on people who were Thy 2 or 1. Um, and nearly half of the patients had benign disease. So in order to get to the diagnosis, they had surgery, which in retrospect was a complete waste of time. And remember, these patients are already being treated for another cancer. Okay. Um, some had metastases and most had thyroid cancer, and funnily enough, 80% is papillary thyroid cancer, three patients there was medullary, and in three patients there was follicular thyroid cancer. Of those with differentiated thyroid cancer, more, more than half had a really excellent prognosis. Mesis less than two is a 20-year survival, 98.5%. And if we look at the follow-up, no one dies of thyroid cancer. There's a medium follow-up of 33 months. But 23% of the patients died. So again, highly morbid, but not from thyroid cancer. Finally, very recent paper uh, from Amsterdam. Again, the starting point was the PET report. Okay, 2% had uh, thyroid incidental omas of which a third were ignored straight away. The whole load had lots of follow-up shown in that busy slide that you don't need to read. But the bottom line is the malignancy was only 4% of all thyroid incidental omas. And more importantly, with the longest follow-up of the three studies since those ATA guidelines, 42% of the cohort died. And interestingly, one patient died from thyroid cancer again medullary thyroid carcinoma, and the predictors of death, as you would expect. And in addition, there are good and bad primary cancer, which we know. So what are the themes in all of this? It's a high mortality in this population of patients who've had a PET request. Remind you, one third of PET thyroid incidental omas are cancers, 80% of the cancers are papillary, and the mortality of the papillary in these studies is zero. Okay. And there are drawbacks to investigating patients with thyroid incidental omas. There's a morbidity. 46% of our patients had surgery that was had surgery, had a hemithyroidectomy to get to the diagnosis that it was benign. Okay, that comes at a cost, both economic and uh, um, some morbidity from the surgery. And then there's the anxiety. It's another problem. These patients have already had chemoradiotherapy, surgery, colectomy, low lung pneumonectomy, who knows what, all right? And for them, 
cancer and cancer, thyroid cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, it all has the same uh, monetary value and, and, and in terms of anxiety. It's another problem, another cancer. It could be malignant. And so many times, oh, we're not sure, the results haven't really moved us on. It's all adding to the stress. So there was an excellent paper uh, in The Lancet a few years ago now. Unimportant cancers should remain undiagnosed. The real challenge these days in our MDTs, we're always wanting to do more and more and more and more. Okay, if it's unimportant, don't diagnose it. Avoid harm, okay, and only pick out the important ones. So we've got rule in and rule out. Well, we can forget about SUV. Um, presence of nodes for sure. Should we be doing, oh, should we be doing um, calcitonin? Okay, in, in Germany, in Austria, in, in Italy, every patient who comes to an, a, a thyroid clinic with a nodule has a calcitonin. We don't do that in UK, but maybe perhaps we should in these patients just to pick out the ones where actually surgery, earlier surgery could make a difference to outcome. Um, and I've already talked about metastases to the thyroid. I think it's on a selected basis. But clearly, we rule out um, comorbidity and malignancies that are carrying a bad prognosis. Okay. So I would like to just end with a proposed algorithm. Okay. Starting with why was the PET scan requested in the first place? And if it's for benign disease, then you treat it as if they'd had an ultrasound or a CT scan. It's the same thing. Okay. And that's managed basically have an ultrasound and you do not biopsy until it gets to 10 millimeters. Biopsying less than 10 millimeters is a sin. If the indication for the PET scan was a cancer and that cancer carries a poor prognosis or the patient has such severe comorbidity, all right, it should be disregarded. And this is where we're asking other MDTs to follow this. Okay. And so the message has obviously got to get to everyone who requests PET scans. And the, I, I, I was talking to Patrick last night, who runs our PET unit uh, in Cardiff. You know, he, he's always trying to just push, ignore, ignore, ignore um, to, the, to the, MDT, the many MDTs that he goes to. If the cancer has a favorable prognosis, and that has to be a judgment by that MDT, Okay, I would propose that we do an ultrasound scan to get a measurement of that nodule uh, because the PET-CT isn't that accurate. And I would also propose up for discussion to measure the calcitonin. If it's less than 10 millimeters, if the calcitonin is high, that, that we then, I can't fit that into that algorithm, but that needs another discussion. If it's less than 10 millimeters, I would say repeat the scan at 12 months and at 24 months, there's no growth discharge. Okay, no needles. If it's more than 10 millimeters, do a biopsy, fine needle aspiration biopsy. Obviously, if it's benign, the patient's discharged. If you get either a malignant thigh four, thigh five, or indeterminate thigh three F, I would propose you do nothing but ultrasound at 12 months and 24 months. And if it's remaining stable, you can defer the intervention. And what that does is, first of all, you now have uh, a clear plan in your head where you can confidently tell your patients what you're going to do. Because one thing they don't want in all this um, mire of uh, uncertainty and anxiety is to have a surgeon stuttering, not quite sure what to do either. But also, it allows us to find out how the patient is faring with the treatment of the malignancy which started them this journey. Okay? Whereas, if there's growth, one would probably go to surgery and probably just a hemithyroidectomy, given that we're talking about a very good prognostic group. And finally, if it's a metastasis, case-based discussion individual case-based discussion, and maybe a hemithyroidectomy. Thank you for your attention.
while everyone's gathering their thoughts, David, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off if I may. Um, this is what you've said is all makes perfect common sense. One of the issues here is what do you think about the psychology of living with a cancer? You've made the point that biopsying uh, micro, micro, uh, papillary thyroid microcarcinomas should, or, or lesions of four millimeters doesn't make sense because this is not going to kill you. But if you don't make the diagnosis and you don't have the psychology issue, but in patients who have another malignancy and then you biopsy something in their thyroid and you say this is suspicious or even a malignancy, don't you find these cancer patients are the ones that most want to have surgery? Because that's my experience. Cancer patients are very pro take it out. So how do you deal with that? Okay, so first of all, I would agree. And we know that in, in Japan, they have a they're really into biopsying everything, regardless of how small it is, and then conservative management. And we've always said, well, if the Brits, you know, if we do a biopsy, and it happens, okay, there's an ultrasound, it's seven millimeters, and the needle's just too close to the radiologist's hand, and in they go, and they diagnose a seven millimeter papillary, and they're sent to us. There's definitely culturally, I think, on this side of the world, it, they want to have it removed. I think it's different, however, in the patients who've been beaten up with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, major surgery for their primary disease. And, and it is, it is it's, it's, it's how you sell it. And I think if we honestly say that this is, Don Lino was used to say, it's cancer in name, but not in nature, you know? And, and it, we have to be confident. We've got to believe in it. But I think if we have that confidence, you know, there's a huge movement, as you know, by many pathologists to not call less than 10 millimeters a cancer. But it's actually the same for probably up to 20 millimeters for many. No. So it is a challenge, but I think it's too easy to bow to their anxiety and do an operation. Because actually, I think we should be uh, stronger and, and, and actually say, no, I can tell you we're not taking any chances with you. We're, we're going to just watch it. If I can just take that a little bit further, I'm, I'm envisaging a patient who you call a good prognosis group. Mm -hmm. That's somebody who, who's had a cancer and been cured by a curative surgeon, and they're, they're told their, their prognosis is fine, but they've got an incidental loma, and your bottom line for a particular size was, well, it might be cancer that you got in your thyroid, so we'll scan after a year or two and let you know then. Sleep well. Only 700 sleeps till the next scan. 700 disturbed sleeps because you know that cancer spreads over a year or two. And I find that conversation quite difficult. It might be cancer, I don't think so. Come back in a year or two and I'll tell you no, no, if difference. it was. You know, it depends how you word it. No, the ones we don't biopsy are less than 10 millimeters. And, and I, we can, we, I can let anyone in the eye and say, if you've got a less than 10 millimeter thyroid cancer, you're never going to die. So we don't even biopsy them. We just show they're not growing. But the ones where you have a malignancy, then you tell them it's not it's not is it isn't it you say you have a thyroid cancer all right uh but it's it can be watched yep any more questions i sense that we're hungry yeah. i sense that we're hungry for clinical cases <laughs> and that nutrition can jolly well wait um i have an idea that downstairs there are large queues of people Wait, uh, queuing up for foods. So you don't want to go and join yeah. that queue. Let them all go, first of all. And we will have two hot, juicy cases. Firstly, uh, we like incidental omas this morning. So we have a case on a challenging adrenal incidental oma. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michele, one of the senior clinical fellow at the moment at Chester Westminster Hospital. I'm uh, um, talking about an interesting, interesting cases we had at Northview Park uh, a few years ago. I was about a 69 years old uh, Asian gentleman who was referred to our endocrinology clinic after he had a CT angiogram for um, abdominal pain and he was found to have a left adrenal um, banana peeling in central of one centimeter and this was in March 2019. His past medical history included uh, AAA, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. 
Hydroxystrain included uh, metformin, one gram BD, canaglifosin, glycoside, 116 uh, BD, indapamine, doxazosin, four milligrams BD, ramipril, five milligrams once a day, omeprazole, and autobastatin. Initial investigation showed a normal uh, uh, 24 hour urinary uh, free cortisol, uh, done twice, twice methanef is normal, and also on the on dosage to running ratio was also normal. The overnight dexamethasone suppression test was sent at the same time of the um, uh, urinary free cortisol. And interesting, we also have a normal um, result. At that point, we thought it was related to concurrent sepsis. Uh, the vascular surgeons were quite keen to undertake his uh, um, auto by iliac quadrupal fenestate EVA. It was done percutaneously in October 2019. There were no stigmata of Cushing disease or Cushing syndrome, and uh, with this unconvincing biochemical results, uh, the surgery, surgery was undertaken without any uh, post op complications. We continued to follow up and we repeated the overnight examination suppression test when it was uh, well and it uh, failed to suppress. It also failed to suppress its low dose examination suppression test with a level 135 and with an ACTH of 52.3 nanogram per liter on the higher side of normal range. His midnight cortisol also was elevated, 107. At this point, we um, organized a pituitary MRI scan to show a four millimeter microadenoma. And in uh, November 2019, his urinary-free cortisol started to become abnormal, 128 and 127, sorry, 187. Patient declined pituitary surgery, and it was commenced on metarapon, and we tightened it up uh, nowadays, it's taking two grams twice a day. In November, he partially agreed to have the workup for surgery. So he underwent an inferior petrosal sinus sampling that confirmed um, pituitary source with ACTH of more than 1,000 on both um, sides and uh, inferior petrosal sinus uh, to plasma ratio about 70 on both sides. And repeat MRI scan done uh, two years uh, after the first one show an uh, increment in size, about six millimeters, and uh, uh, protein acid content. Is uh, discussing uh, MDT, and it is scheduled for um, as part of surgery. So I think this case highlights uh, the importance of um, adrenal MDT initially, um, so X-ray MDT initially, locally, and then refer to the uh, neurosurgical MDT. The fact he actually underwent uh, vascular surgery when one was still um, investigated for hypercortisolemia. The other problem we had was a time span for him actually to reach diagnosis was about two years. Um, and uh, an unimportant point is uh, respect patient's opinion and try to negotiate with him. Uh, interesting remain asymptomatic throughout all these two years. His weight was 77 kilos on the first clinic uh, admission and about 81 kilos nowadays. The only thing that changed was uh, now he's requiring uh, a basaga 24 units to try to control his diabetes, but at this latest HB1C is uh, acceptable. The fact we have to insist um, to reach the diagnosis and try to um, come up with a final plan for him, which at the moment is to repeat the MRI if there's further increment in size and his possible plan for surgery if he agrees um, in the next year. So my question um, is this, uh, how many in this case uh, of you will try to continue with the conservative management and how we'll try to push, you, push him to have a pituitary surgery and what strategies will you use to try to convince him? Right, I'll think everybody, get on your phones. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, jury's out there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Don't go, okay. don't go. My goodness, there's a hundred questions for you. <laughs> Anybody want to comment rather than asking a question? Yeah, you all want to comment. You're all itching to comment. Who'd like the microphone? Yeah, that's better. 
<laughs> no symptoms. No symptoms. No signs. So, no so what would the patient say in the pub chatting to his friend? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I got over all that abdominal stuff, and then they found a shadow, and then another shadow, and then the numbers weren't right, and I'm locked into years of morbidity. <laughs> uh, David Scott Coombs is simmering here, saying <laughs> this is all anxiety about about doctors' interests rather than about patient health. Do you think the nodule was caused by ACTH? The adrenal nodule? Yeah. No, we don't think it's... So you're, you're, it's you're, you're suggesting that he's got an adrenal nodule which is not causing Cushing's but led you to do a whole pile of tests which led you to find pituitary Cushing's. This story's getting more yeah, it was, it, it, tenuous, isn't it, as, as time goes on? I think that the fact that we sent at the same time, there, because if it was not sent there, if we didn't do the first overnight experimental suppression test and just sending there free cortisol in the urine and they think that it's normal, we say, okay, it's an adrenaline centaloma, metanapes are normal, aldosterone interaction is normal, urine and cortisol is normal, can be discharged. And actually, we there was a done everything at the same time and it's let us to repeat it. There was a debate at the BES or even just a presentation of the BES uh, one year, not so long ago, when I think it might, um, forgive me if you're from Birmingham, I think it might have been Birmingham saying, you have to interpret a dexamethasone expression, expression test intelligently, and it's not a binary thing. Uh, less than 50 is one thing, but 100 think. And some other people uh, from another endocrine center, a little east of here in London, saying if my overnight dexamethasone expression test was 100, I'd go for an adrenalectomy, no question. Black and white stuff. They completely divided the room. I learned from that about the division, Jeannie. Well, I think you've done him a favor because actually he does need to know that he's got Cushing's disease. He does need to know that this is going to cause him morbidity in the end. He's already got uncontrolled diabetes. So you have done him a favor, whichever way he looks at it, you've done him a favor. <laughs> Thank you. That's a nice way of putting it. I, I, I can't argue with that. Beebke. Hang on to the microphone because then people at home can hear you and I'm sure they'll want to. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, you know, like I agree with this. Obviously, it's also the um, having the clinical feeling, the, the bioassay, as Bruno Alolio, my mentor, always called it. Yeah, but obviously, we see that the cortisol after DEX is 135 nanomoles per liter. So that would, I would take this quite serious. And the patient has type 2 diabetes and hypertension. So I take this also very serious. So, uh, so in these patients, um, we would usually um, do an ACTH and a DHEAS just to see where things are going. Yeah, because these could be also patients with MUX who are relevant for an adrenalectomy if it would be an adrenal tumor or something. Yeah, like sort of um, definitely, I think, um, uh, obviously I'm from Birmingham, but soon uh, from Imperial College. Yeah, so, so I'll do the fusion. Um, so um, I think if it's above 100, I would take it serious. And if it's below 100, we can certainly observe. And the ACTH is interesting. You, with an adrenal nodule, you'd like to think that the ACTH is undetectable or raised. I, I mean, it might be 10 or it might be 50, but it shouldn't be 30, should it? Don't you find those ones are really irritating when you, when you want to know if the ACTH is suppressed or, or not? Uh, not entirely bimodal as you, as you would hope. Have we helped you? Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> you certainly helped us. Thank you very much for presenting that patient. Thank you. And finally, in this mixed session, something we haven't been thinking about this morning, but we're about to, a presentation on type 2 amyodrine induced thyrotoxicosis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Saf. I'm one of the FY1 doctors at the Lister. Um, and today I'll be presenting a case of type 2 amyodrine induced thyrotoxicosis. So this was a 74-year-old woman who presented to ED with a one to two week history of tremors, palpitation and anxiety, a two month history of progressive shortness of breath on exertion and a one to two week history of leg swelling. 
On examination, she was noted to have a tremor, a regular heart rate of 100 beats per minute, um, and bilateral edema to the mid shins. Um, however, she had no palpable goiter or proptosis. She had a complex medical, medical background, which included diabetes, pulmonary hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, and a previous uh, cabbage surgery as well. Um, and her medications included amiodarone 100 milligrams um, and propranolol 10 milligrams. So blood tests, uh, initial blood tests revealed a raised uh, NT pro VMP of 517, a low TSH, um, and a raised 3T4 level of 93. Therefore, the impression was suspected heart failure complicated by amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis. So just a question for the audience, um, how would you initially treat this thyrotoxicosis? There we go. Um, so would you initially just monitor and wait for further investigations to determine the subtype, treat with prednisolone alone, treat with uh, carbimazole alone, um, surgery and leucose iodine, and also a combination of prednisolone and carbimazole. Right, quite everyone vote. I know we're all free, but let's keep going. Okay, so it seems that most people went for a combination of both steroids um, and an antithyroid medication. Um, so how we treated it initially uh, was a loop diuretic for the heart failure. Um, the patient was already on propranolol, so again for the heart failure, um, and carbimazole 30 milligrams once daily and prednisolone 40 milligrams, so we treated it empirically. Um, and just another question, the final question, um, how would you further investigate this patient? Okay, um, so would you do an ultrasound thyroid, a thyroid uptake scan, color flow Doppler studies of thyroids, um, a combination of the color flow Doppler and the thyroid uptake scan, um, or would you think no imaging is needed and just thyroid antibodies tests alone? Okay, so a bit more of a mixed um, view here, but it seems like most people went for a combination. Um, so what we did at least is uh, the, the initial doctors that saw this patient in the ED had ordered an ultrasound thyroid scan, um, which showed a well-defined uh, 11 millimeter nodule on the right thyroid and multiple sub-centimeter nodules compatible with benign U2 thyroid nodules. Um, we later then did a uh, thyroid uptake scan, which showed globally reduced contrast uptake, um, and also antibodies were negative as well. So given all of this together and following review by the endocrinologist, uh, we deemed it to be type 2 um, AIT, and subsequently uh, her carbimazole was stopped. And this is just uh, some pictures of the imaging. So on the left, you can see uh, a, the globally reduced thyroid uptake and on the right, the thyroid ultrasound scan, you can see these small um, sub-centimeter nodules as well. So review one month later, um, revealed a normal thyroid examination, um, normal TFTs, um, and therefore the prednisolone was in the process of being tapered down um, with regular monitoring for any exacerbations that could require higher steroid dosing again. Um, and review in clinic three months later, revealed normal TFTs again. So just some um, discussion points. Uh, type 2 AIT reflects a thyrotoxic process um, caused by direct toxicity from the drug amiodarone, um, releasing preformed T3, uh, T4. It classically occurs in people without underlying thyroid disease. Um, in contrast, type 1 occurs in those um, with pre-existing thyroid disease and is due to the iodine content in amiodarone, um, increasing hormonal synthesis. 
Differentiating the two types requires good history taking um, and physical examination skills to uh, determine if there's underlying thyroid uh, condition, but also radiology is important. Um, reduced uptake on thyroid uh, uptake scan combined with the benign nodules on the ultrasound indicated type 2 etiology in this patient. And just a sort of summary flowchart of what we did, but also just incorporate, incorporating some of the things from the literature. Um, so we have an initial presumed AIT based on the history examination and the TFTs. Um, we stop the amiodarone if it's possible to do so, um, empirically starting with an antithyroid medication and prednisolone together. Then we did the radiological investigations um, to determine the subtype. Um, so the thyroid uptake scan showed a reduced uptake in our case. Um, from the literature, it shows a color flow Doppler studies, if it's available, uh, can be very helpful. I, I think it's up to 80% of people um, can be determined the different subtypes um, using this investigation alone. Um, and from this, you can either get type one with a normal increased uptake um, or type two with a reduced uptake. Um, if it's type two in our case, we stopped the antithyroid medication and continued the prednisolone, monitoring the TFTs regularly for any potential exacerbations. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. Can I ask, um, for, forgive me if you don't know this, but did, did, was, the, was the carbimazole stopped for the uptake scan? Before. For the purposes of the imaging? For the purposes of the imaging, I don't believe so, no. No. So you carried out, you did the uptake scan while taking carbamazole. Does that change the answer? No, but does the fact that you're taking carbamazole at the time that you're giving technetium to the thyroid change the uptake? I think it does. I think you would normally stop the carbamazole five days before. Indeed, less than 10 milligrams, of ambition, but this person was, was taking 30. So in a sense, you have to predict your answer to get the scan done, which helps you with, with, with the answer. Jeannie. But also, the uptake scan needs to be um, uh, viewed with caution in somebody who's taking amiodarone because that can also reduce the uptake itself. So the ultrasound is actually more useful in this circumstance to tell you whether it's high flow or low flow because the uh, uptake scan can look low even if they've got graves if they've had amiodarone well exactly i mean the problem is that the, this patient has been flooded with iodine for months remember amiodarone is 37 percent by weight iodine the way to remember that is that amiodarone is also 37 percent by spelling iodine you can see the iodine in the word amiodarone and so Surely the uptake scan is always going to be negative if you've been having a high dose of iodine all that time. So although here it's the defining one, we know it's a flawed one. I think mostly we go empirically, don't we? And hope to get away with it, which is a horrible way of doing medicine. <laughs> but there's a question up at, up at the back. Shall I? Uh, the, no, the, the, the tracer is related to a nuclear reactor in Moll in Belgium, which is down, and that's where they split uranium and make molybdenum, from which we get technetium, and that should be fixed within, uh, I hope, a matter of days. It's been down for nearly a month now. Um, um, but should we use colour flow Doppler? Yes, but I can't get anybody to give me an intelligent answer on that. I can't get an ultrasound person to do that. Um, might there be an argument? I think, if I'm correct, type 2 is by far the most common of the two uh, types of amyloid induced thyrotoxicosis. Is it, was there ever an argument for just using prednisolone to start with until you get your tests? Because often the tests take quite a long time. And I know carbamazole is relatively benign in most cases, but it kind of gets a bit confusing until you get the test, you don't quite know what's working. Is it the carbamazole that's having the effect or is it the prednisolone that's having the effect? And I tend to hedge my bets on the examination and the history and usually go for one or the other, and it's predominantly usually prednisolone, but I don't know what, that other, what other people do. Uh, I think that's very pragmatic and, and fair comment, and it's heartening to hear you say that. Anybody want to support that or counter that or Jeannie, and then it's time for lunch.
I think it's it, yeah, that is a sensible approach, but I think it's actually quite difficult when someone's got a free T4 of 93 and they're in heart failure um, to not actually give cobimazole as well, just to make sure you're not missing, you know, a thyroid storm from Graves' thyroid toxicosis. So I think cobimazole and steroids is the right thing to do in this circumstance. I would not give them cobimazole if it was a Friday night and I wanted to get them under control. So I think it's really reasonable to, to give them cobimazole, even though you think it might be a... Um, yeah, type two. Easy to write the review, but very hard in clinical practice. It's one of those clinical situations. We're coming to lunch, but let's have another question. Thank you very much. Uh, nice case. I was just wondering, uh, what if the patient cannot uh, stop amiodarone? What will be the approach here? And in if both, hadn't, sorry. If yeah, the, if the patient cannot be stopped, uh, the amiodarone cannot be stopped in that patient particularly, what would be the approach in both types and what would be the course of that patient's? I think, I think based on my reading from the literature, it, there are obviously cases when amiodarone can't be stopped because of the need for cardiac sort of um, um, indication. Um, in those situations, they've recommended to continue with the amiodarone, um, but obviously start the treating drug dependent on, on whichever type it is. So amiodarone with the steroid, amiodarone with the antithyroid medication, depending on if it's type one or two. In, in practice, I don't think it makes that much difference because amiodarone has such a, long, such a long half-life and a lot of intrathyroidal concentration as well. Crossing off amiodarone is the least exciting thing to do in medicine because nothing happens for about a year. <laughs> I think we need to break for lunch, don't we? I'm getting... Okay. Um, thank you very we, much for an interesting case. Thank you very much. If we could reconvene 2.40 sharp, please, but really sharp. I was going to say 2.30, but 2.40. We are overrunning here. You can take a voucher on the way out, and you can use any of the desks for, uh, for food. There's a main canteen and there's a, sort of a side, a side uh, counter as well. Yeah, because they were in the same room alphabetically. Yes. Franklin and Gamage, yes. FG. Yes. Yes. My wife and I were A and W. Oh, but in the opposite. In the, in the medical school, they divided it into two quarters, without quarters, without quarters together for the second year. So we met in the second year. The A and Ws came together. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so this is fate, you know, by alphabet. Absolutely. <laughs> Friends of mine, they studied together, but only uh, met on the last day of medical school. Oh, really? Yeah, because we had a, in, in Cologne, they um, have 650 students a year. Is that, so, is that what you're training? Yeah, so like 400 start in autumn and 250 in summer. And so it's totally possible that you don't ever meet. Are we good to go? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good to go? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our next session in this multidisciplinary endocrine symposium. Hats off to the lunch team. They kept us going. They kept serving, even though we were long after their closing time, and I'm very appreciative of that. We have more goodies this afternoon. We were talking just before lunch about adrenal nodules. And we all know it's a real problem. Needle in the haystack. This is an intriguing title, finding the needle and making the haystack smaller. Well, I'd like to introduce Professor Vibke Alt, who has come from Birmingham to do this talk and is coming from Birmingham to settle here <laughs> shortly. Very exciting times for all concerned. Uh, no more introduction. We're intrigued by your title, Vibke. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And, um, and I think the, the title was given to me by Fausto and I kept it. Fausto, thanks. <laughs> cool. So many thanks for having me here. Yeah. And um, I just realized it's my last um, talk with the Birmingham logo. So that's uh, obviously very historic because I've been in Birmingham for exactly 20 years. And from the 1st of January, I will be um, the director of the MRC LMS of the MRC London Institute of Medical Sciences, which you saw at lunchtime, the golden building that's just outside um, the lunch um, space. And obviously I'm looking forward to lots of interactions um, on the Imperial College campus and um, obviously selfishly I can say with endocrinology in particular.
Okay, cool. So like, um, I will be talking, let me see. Yeah, cool. So like, uh, uh, no, not in show. Yeah, like this, that's uh, perfect. Okay, so I'm talking about adrenal incidentalomas, so incidentally discovered nodules. Yeah, and this is this very nice paper that uh, Irina Bankos from the Mayo Clinic had it on, who actually did two years as a postdoc uh, in my group in Birmingham, and now established herself as one of the leaders internationally on adrenal incidentaloma. And um, she has access to very nice population-based data because the Mayo Clinic is in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and they keep very nice records. Yeah, the, most people there are like of Scandinavian or German origin, so it has limited diversity, their data. But what you can nicely see is that obviously the rate of um, uh, ad adrenal incidence, aloma incidence, um, over a period from 1995 to 2020 goes continuously up. And that is obviously usually due to more use of cross-sectional imaging over time. And uh, in red, you, this uh, purple is the overall curve. And in red, you see the so-called adrenal incidental lomas. So not masses that are discovered on or the occasion of staging or follow-up for cancer. So that's sort of excluded here. And um, also not for um, suspected adrenal disease, like patients who have, for example, signs um, of Cushing's. So when we look at adrenal incidental lomas, we want to answer two important questions. Hormone excess, is there any that could be detrimental to health and malignancy? Obviously, this question is very much more important to the patients. They, they worry, is this cancer? So they don't um, know so much about the adrenal cortex as a hormone factory. So if you look at hormone excess, obviously there's a standardized workup. We exclude primary aldosteronism, obviously in particular in patients with hypertension through paired plasma renin and aldosterone. We exclude Cushing's and also mild autonomous cortisol secretion, MUX, um, through the use of the one milligram dexamethasone overnight test. We exclude adrenal androgen excess and usually only in larger tumors when we suspect malignancy because usually secretion, over secretion of adrenal androgens is um, a likely sign of adrenocortical malignancy, of adrenocortical cancer. And obviously we need to exclude pheochromocytoma by plasma metanephrine. So, and it's important to realize that adrenal imaging actually performs very poorly. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis I published um, together with John Deeks in 2016. And John Deeks is a fantastic diagnostic test specialist. Many of you may know him from his input into the um, COVID testing. And um, basically he said uh, the data that were produced by the systematic review showed some of the poorest practice he has ever seen as a test specialist. And the problem is that many of the radiological papers are sort of like convenience cohorts. So these are not design studies, and now we will image them like this in comparison, but uh, usually they are the experiences with our last 800 patients with, yeah? And that obviously doesn't count um, as the design that is required to come up with sensitivity and specificity. And this systematic review revealed that there were actually only two studies with 102 patients that could be analyzed for non-contrast CT, 75 patients for MRI, and 64 patients for PET in the world literature. Yeah, that's obviously important, and there's no evidence base for CT contrast washout. And since we published the um, systematic review, data have come out to look at this, which show that CT contrast washout does not perform and should not be done. There are more data for PET, it, um, PET shows a high sensitivity but poor specificity. Yeah, so if a PET is negative, uh, then you know it's benign, but if it's positive, it can be anything. And um, so currently the evidence base, we just reviewed it for the guideline again, is still pointing towards non-contrast CT as a primary um, a test of choice in imaging. Yeah, like sort of, and um, this is actually the first patient with adrenocortical carcinoma I treated as a medical student. Yeah, and she gave me permission for use of this picture. She had a cortisol and androgen producing adrenocortical carcinoma that was metastasized and uncontrolled and not controllable. And that shows the impact on the individual patients in their last um, period of life. And adrenocortical carcinoma is obviously highly malignant. It's difficult to treat. 
And uh, in the large series that are uh, collected at specialist centers, we find 2 to 11 percent of patients in principle have adrenocortical carcinoma, while overall, if you look at very tiny nodules, uh, then obviously it's rarer. So and it provides a real challenge to differentiate adrenocortical adenomas from carcinoma. And this is why we set out to look for novel biomarkers. So in a way, we need two things. The, the only really good approach to adrenocortical carcinoma to ACC is curative surgery as early as possible. So for one, we would like to discover early. And secondly, obviously, there are many, many more benign nodules. Yeah? And we want to avoid that people who potentially even have comorbidity undergo surgery they might die from, yeah, like sort of, and um, even elective laparoscopic surgery has obviously some mortality due to thromboembolism. So in the areas um, where my group is interested in is steroid metabolomics and the untargeted metabolome. So in a way, we look what uh, the tumor produces and um, can this tell us something about uh, what is happening there. What is a steroid metabolome? Um, the adrenal cortex, as you know, is a hormone factory and it produces three kinds of hormones in principle, aldosterone, the blood pressure hormone, cortisol, the sugar and stress hormone, and, and the precursors to the androgens. The active androgens are obviously generated in the periphery, like also the estrogens are. And uh, all these steroids have actually metabolites in the urine. They are excreted as metabolites in the urine. And this allows us actually very nicely to measure all these metabolites um, by mass spectrometry. So, and what was the hypothesis of the work? In a way, we say ACC cells, are, to totally simplify, are immature cells. They are not very well differentiated, while adrenocortical adenoma, ACA cells, are differentiated cells. So, the hypothesis was that adenomas will have all end products of steroidogenesis in their capability while um, undifferentiated cells, which we find in cancer, might only produce the first steps of steroidogenesis, which we conventionally do not measure in our routine assays. Yeah, this is how the 24-hour urine steroid metabolome looks for 88 healthy controls. This is actually a mixture of men and women. They are not so different. And you see in blue here the active androgen metabolites, uh, what we produce a lot as healthy adults. But you see in orange, the glucocorticoid metabolites are actually really the majority what we perform. But the precursors, the glucocorticoid precursors, the mineralocorticoid precursors, and the adrenal androgen precursors are usually excreted in much lower amounts. And what we do in the lab is we do multisteroid profiling. We started this gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, which is relatively low throughput. But now we've moved on, and I will tell you about this also to high throughput tandem mass spectrometry. And so this was our proof of concept paper, which came out um, exactly 11 years ago. We collaborated with the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors, NSAT, and collected 24-hour urines from 102 patients with adrenocortical adenoma proven by follow-up and imaging, and 47 patients with ACC, with adrenocortical carcinoma proven by metastasis and progression. And then we did steroid mass spectrometry, generated the steroid profiles, and then I collaborated with Michael Beal, a computer science collaborator and friend of mine, and he uh, applied a machine learning method, GMLBQ, to look at how the steroids relate to each other, and if there's any difference in the profiles between the B9 and the malignant tumors. And very intriguingly, we found that there is actually a distinct steroid fingerprint of ACCs, of adrenocortical cancers. And this is mostly made up, actually, of precursor steroids. Yeah, so steroids which we conventionally do not measure in the lab. So, and how uh, can this be applied? For example, I show these two examples. There are two large and nasty-looking tumors. Both of them look not very good. You see this one here and this one there. Very fuzzy, not nice. And um, if you run the urine steroid metabolome of this patient here, the green triangle, you see it's very close to the red dots. And what are the red dots? These are the steroid metabolome, the 32-dimensional relationship of the steroids to each other of adrenocortical cancers. And the blue dots are actually patients who have benign adenomas. <clears throat> you see there is some overlap. You don't have 100% sense in spec, but we have 90% sense in spec, which is totally superior to imaging in this proof of concept study. So basically, but on the right side, this really large, nasty looking mass you see here, 
actually, the green triangle came to le um, lie very close to the blue ones, surprising us, and prompting us actually to do a biopsy. And that was, in that case, an intelligent decision. The left one was actually a highly malignant adrenocortical carcinoma, and the right one was a primary adrenal non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So we spared this patient a major surgery, and uh, she was actually started on high-dose chemotherapy two days later and is now a long-term survivor. Yeah, so like, um, so this is a good way to see how these things can be used. And Vasilis Cortis, who did his PhD with me and then was lecturer with us and is now at Harvard working with David Brio, um, he used this also to see if steroid metabolomics can be used for recurrence detection. And all the green dots you see on this slide here, the red is again the ACC steroid metabolomes, the blue, the benign metabolomes, and all the green dots are from one patient, a very motivated patient who is a biologist and who collected all these 24 hour urines before and after her surgery for adenocortical carcinoma. This is her preoperative urine, you see clearly in the red range. And you see these urines here, 18 to 23, which were collected um, when she actually presented with an isolated liver metastasis. So the urine presented first, and we did imaging out of cycle, and she had an isolated liver metastasis, which was treated. And you see on the right here all the nice urines ever since. Yeah, so, so it's a good tool for the recurrence detection, and Vasilis looked at this um, um, with a GCMS approach uh, in 135 patients, defining a recurrence-free and a recurrence cohort as a pilot proof-of-concept study. He, and in a way, you can compare over time. This, these are different urines collected at different times. You can do your profile and then see how do the steroids lie, and you see here suddenly a block of red appears. And red is then three months later, the radiological recurrence documented, and then here treatment. And um, this detection is actually luckily not compromised by mitotain therapy. Mitotain impacts on the steroid profile, but uh, not on the steroids we use for detection. And um, it is very much better to have the preoperative urine. This is a fingerprint that really must be preserved because it's more difficult to do recurrence detection if you don't know exactly the pattern of the preoperative urine. Yeah, so this is another patient, same thing. Yeah, and another patient, same thing. Yeah, like, and um, this was published two years ago by Vars before he went to Harvard. And he also, um, compared the performance of three clinicians. Um, so um, I don't say which clinician I am, C1, C2, or C3. And what he nicely could um, demonstrate is that you can, by clinician judgment, and he showed them total superiority, obviously, of the computer, uh, you can detect in the urine the signs of recurrence in a blinded fashion. So we were not told which one is recurrent or not, but we were just given hundreds of urines to judge. Um, you can detect up to 10 months before radiology detects it. Yeah, like sort of, uh, which is really interesting. And then we applied the computer method and that was obviously much superior to clinicians one, two, three, and had a very good performance. Yeah. And um, so basically he's uh, extending this work now on the side while doing his mouse experiments in Harvard. And um, he's now looking, has looked with principal component analysis at the steroid metabolomes only of adrenocortical carcinoma patients. Very interestingly, he finds um, um, with two different methods, yeah, this uh, Tisney and uh, stochastic neighborhood embedment, embedding and uh, principal component analysis, he finds three distinct groups, which are quite separate. And, He's very interested now to explore the biology of that and also like um, the clinical impact. And uh, here you can see it nicely. These are the steroids that were measured and you see that there are very different profiles between this red and the green and the blue cluster. Okay, but back to our malignant steroid fingerprint and applying it to adrenal incidentalomas. So Angela Taylor in the lab, when she started with me, she um, worked on transferring the GCMS assay, which is very low throughput, a very highly skilled technician or postdoc works on 20 samples for a week. Yeah, um, well, LCMS obviously can measure hundreds um, in a day. Yeah. And so she worked on transferring this on a multi-steroid um, platform and developed an assay. And you see on the left, this is GCMS, B9 tumors, malignant tumors. And on the right is um, LCMS, tandem mass spectrometry, high throughput, B9 
inline tumors and malignant tumors. And you see these are very similar profiles of a multi-steroid profiling assay. And if you compare the rock curves, this is also a very similar performance. And on the basis of the rock curves, we actually decided to take 15 steroids for our prospective validation study. Yeah, so 10 minutes to detect an ACC versus assay. And now um, very important comments about diagnostic tests. I'm um, uh, on the side, I'm uh, the editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Endocrinology, and I get lots of papers where people show me fantastic new tests. And then it's in a way, it's important when you go into the test business to know how this works. It, you might run tests and then you say, wow, it works well, now we should all do it. This is not how it works. You need to define a cutoff, you define your reference range, and then you need to validate the cutoffs you apply to say that in a prospective cohort, this would also work well. So you discover your biomarker, but then you need to verify it, validate it, clinically validate it. And then if you want to introduce it, you have to have regulatory yeah. approval and uh, document clinical utility. And uh, John Deeks um, collaborated with me on that because he was intrigued um, by our work. And he said, uh, good news, Wiebke, you only need to include 2,000 consecutive patients with a 5% adrenocortical carcinoma rate, and there you have it. And uh, then I sort of explained to him that the largest ever adrenal incidentaloma study was published by an Italian group who collected for 18 years 1,000 patients retrospectively. <laughs> so like sort of, and he said, yeah, but that's what you need. So like sort of, we set off. And, uh, and we set off this urine act study, evaluation of urine steroid metabolomics in the differential diagnosis of adrenocortical tumors. And this was obviously only achieved by um, pan-European collaboration. And you see here the um, PIs of the different centers that contributed um, to the urine act study. And um, you see here the recruitment, which was from 2011 to 2016. And at the end, we had reached 2,200 patients. And we achieved a 4.9% ACC rate in this prospective collection from unbiased centers. Biased centers were excluded. And, um, and um, John Deeks accepted this, was close enough to five, so we were relieved. And 84% of these patients were adrenal incidentalomas. So Irina Bankos was totally fundamental to this. So she came uh, to me with a Mayo Clinic fellowship for two years, and she was absolutely massively helpful in driving the recruitment and helping me coordinate everything. And she now runs her own group and is associate professor at the Mayo Clinic. So this shows you the cohort, 4.9% adrenocortical carcinoma, 88% adenomas. But because we had this huge cohort of 2,200 patients, we also found some other benign tumors and other malignant tumors. So, and here you see the spectrum of size, and you can see that adenomas are usually less than five centimeters. Yeah, most of them actually less than four centimeters. Well, you see that ACCs are rarely below four centimeters. Only two patients were that, but they have a huge spectrum of size. Yeah. So, and, and important to note here that the y-axis here is in the hundreds, and the y-axis here is very low. Yeah. So that means if you go for the larger ones, you will also detect lots of adenomas still if you look at five and six centimeters. There are many, many more adenomas than uh, carcinomas in that. But as this was a prospective collection, which was as unbiased as it's possible. So like um, um, a very important biological answer here, we cannot detect ACCs earlier. They seem to occur and then have explosive growth. This is clear conclusion statistically, says John Deeks, because in this prospective cohort, you have only two patients who were less than four centimeters. While if it would be, if they would be continuously growing, you would expect you see all kinds of ACCs. Yeah, so early detection is possibly something that we can't optimize uh, much further. And um, so the best cutoff of size of suspicion is still four centimeters, because it gave 98% sensitivity and 79.6% specificity. So poor specificity, obviously, but a, a lot of sensitivity without giving your specificity completely away. Yeah, if you go for two centimeters, you have 30% specificity. And obviously then the Hounsfield units are important. We know lipid rich is benign and lipid poor is suspicious, but there are loads and loads lipid poor adenoma, so it doesn't totally help us. And if you look at the unenhanced CT results, 
of patients with beeline adenoma in this cohort, actually you see that only 68.5% fulfilled less than 10 Hounsfield units. 17% um, were 10 to 20, which was previously considered as suspicious and 15% greater than 20. Yeah. So there are loads of patients um, uh, that can be considered indeterminate on this basis, but are actually benign. So you see this, our study as a prospective study um, showed that the Hounsfield unit cutoff of suspicion is 20 and not 10. With this, you have 99% sensitivity and 80% um, specificity. Yeah, like if you go for 10, you gain 1% in sensitivity, but you lose a huge amount of specificity. And that means loads of patients that don't need surgery. So, and basically in this cohort, 568 patients underwent adrenalectomy. And if you looked at the histology and the biochemistry, actually 38% of them did not require surgery. Yeah, and this was a performance of highly specialist NSAID centers from across Europe. It was not like all practitioners. So, and basically, um, um, obviously you still have the other benign and the other malignant ones, and they have a very heterogeneous uh, imaging appearance. As I said, we did not include patients who were undergoing follow-up of cancer or staging of cancer. There were also like 30 patients amongst the 2,200 who had metastases. Half of them were sort of women who had been discharged with breast cancer 15 years ago. And half of them were actually um, patients who had a primary cancer outside of the adrenal, but the adrenal nodule led to a discovery. But these are obviously tiny numbers, really. So if you look at it overall, B9 adenomas will have, in 60% of the cases, a Hounsfield unit of uh, less than 10. In 26% of the cases, a Hounsfield unit of 10 to 20. And in 14% still, a Hounsfield unit greater than 20. While FIOs and ACCs and other malignant masks will mostly have a Hounsfield unit of greater 20. These are data both from the X study and from very nice data from the Mayo Clinic, their long-term database, and um, from Letizia Kanu from her fantastic JCM paper on uh, patients with pheochromocytoma. So this is really an important slide uh, to have in mind. So what did we do then with the urine steroid metabolomics? We received the 2,200 samples, lots of boxes, everything nicely labeled, and you see all the brave people in the lab who worked through the 2,200 urine samples and did the steroid mass spectrometry, and then everything was analyzed by machine learning. And then, um, according to a cutoff that was established by a Delphi consensus amongst the clinician, so when would they be satisfied? How many could still be positive or negative? There were cutoffs established for low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And high risk was agreed to be the one where we would take action. And this is a comparison of single test strategies. This is uh, tumors with greater four centimeters, tumors with greater 20 Hounsfield unit, and patients who have um, high-risk urine steroid metabolomics results. And what you see is the red bars are pretty much all the same size, but the blue bars are obviously much higher when you apply imaging parameters than when you look at urine steroid metabolomics. And if you combine the two tests, three possibilities here, you see the blue bar becomes smaller and smaller and best performance here is size and urine steroid metabolomics. And the overall best performance is if you combine Zeiss, Hounsfield unit, and on the non-contrast CT and urine steroid metabolomics. So what you achieve here is very important, our second goal, to shrink the hundreds and thousands of patients who unnecessarily are operated on suspicion of a malignant mass who indeed have a B9 mass. Yeah, so this is sort of like the new triple test, and that was prospectively validated in the urine X study, and that paper was published two years ago in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. And um, it came with an accompanying um, editorial. And now we obviously work on implementing this. So the algorithm in a way in patients without a history of cancer is you do an unenhanced CT of the adrenals. Obviously you do your standard biochemical workup to exclude hormone excess. And then you determine who's benign, less than four centimeters, less than 20 Hounsfield units. And, um, and greater four centimeter, greater 20 Hounsfield units they get a urine steroid metabolomics profile. Yeah, and if it's positive, they go straight to surgery. 
And if it's negative, and also the patients who fall in the middle category, which is a small number of patients, then you consider an individualized approach. That can be an FDG PET. As I said, if it's negative, the patient is, doesn't have a malignant mass. But if it's positive, it can be anything. It could be even a biopsy, or some centers may say, oh, then I take it out. But that's obviously individual um, practice. And obviously, we are currently discussing hot-headedly about um, what is the impact on the next guideline. Yeah, And obviously, urine steroid metabolomics um, will be mentioned in there. But obviously, what is required now to create a test that can be widely rolled out. And as you see, it takes a long time to develop a test. This is when Ensch came on board and when Irina came on board. And um, this was a proof of principle study. This is when we recruited for Urine Act. This was a urine act analysis, and in 2020, we published the paper, and you see they produce a lot of children um, during the course of uh, these, this study, yeah, like, and uh, so they are really fantastic multitaskers. And um, we are now moving forward um, to a complex intervention trial, where multiple groups are contributing strategically, and um, James Hawley is involved, who's doing his PhD um, with me, who's a principal biochemist in Manchester, but now um, undertaking a PhD. We are very excited because the MSC has told us he is eligible to apply for a clinical research training fellowship and he would be the first clinical biochemist ever applying. So, uh, so he's very keen to pursue this. And, um, and we are working now on uh, getting the regulatory approval to roll the test out, not only as a research test, but um, for use um, in the NHS. Yeah, and obviously, thanks to all the investigators who have contributed to this. And um, big time, obviously, to the team who are shown here, the computer scientists, the evidence synthesis group, the synthesis group led by John Deeks and um, Alice Sitch, um, and Thomas Papa Thomas, who is our um, chief pathologist for the research purposes. Yeah, and um, many thanks for your attention. Wow, I'm absolutely blown away. I've been waiting for the next stage of this story and you really delivered it fantastically. <laughs> Comments, questions, I'll walk around so that you can get the microphone. Whilst people are formulating their questions, can I ask you a question? Sure, in, go for in it. Your, in your um, algorithm there, you, you say that um, pounds feel greater than 20, dimensions less than four centimeters, you would not do steroid profiling if I've understood correctly. Yes. So the question I have to ask is, well, are they the patients that are most going to benefit? Because the, one of our issues is adrenal cortical carcinoma, if you get it small, you do curative surgery, yes. even, even minimally invasive, so even but, laparoscopic. Yes, but, but once... you, you don't get it small. In this study, you know, like sort of that had, I think in total, plus the bias centers, 128 ACCs amongst the 2,367 patients, yeah, um, and two of them were less than four centimeters. So that statistically means you will never detect them early just uh, by chance. Yeah, like sort of because otherwise you would have expected, John Geek says, that you um, have, you know, like a spectrum of growth if they would be continuously slowly growing. Yeah, but he said that you pretty much everybody is detected uh, um, large, apart from two patients less than four centimeters. Yeah, um, that means they are growing pretty explosively and the likelihood that you catch them when they are small is low. And if you go down, and we are currently looking at this because obviously a lot of people who are currently discussing the protocol said, oh, should it be 3.5 centimeters or should it be three centimeters? But, um, and we are discussing the, this with the test diagnostic guys. Yeah, like sort of, but obviously they point out um, with every millimeter in a way you have then hundreds and hundreds of patients that undergo surgery. The question is, what can you, so some of the ACC people, they say, I need to discover them all. Yeah, but that's for the price. That's the price you have to pay to discover them all. Yeah, like sort of, or can the lift is say, yes, I feel guilty. I will miss one. Yeah, like sort of, but um, I prevented then 70 to undergo surgery from the same group. Yeah, like sort of, that's sort of like what we have to think about. Yeah, and, um, and there are terrible things in there, you know, like sort of people who have large tumors that then are whatever, a lipid poor adrenomyelolipoma, where like part of the pancreas was taken out the kidney, or you know, like sort of horror trip, and then it was all benign. Yeah, like, um, so we need to sort of 
Somebody. somebody. <laughs> okay. Question from above. So I've got two questions. One is, uh, can you do these tests for uh, without a 24-hour urine? And the other question relates to a lecture before. Uh, that is, can you use this to find out whether it's ACTH or non-ACTH Cushing's? As there's, is the metabolic profile different? Um, yes. So like sort of James, whom I showed on the last slide, James Hawley, this is exactly the part of his PhD. He looks actually all these patients from urine act also have uh, collected a morning spot urine. Yeah, like so we look at morning spot urine and we have additional cohort where patients just collect a timed overnight urine, which is more convenient for patients that they write down when they go to bed, they empty their bladder when they go to bed, and then they uh, um, pee into the pot when they get up in the morning and write down when this was, and then we can um, calculate a um, hourly excretion rate. We also have now a 28 steroid serum, multi-steroid profile, and we will also compare urine against serum, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that urine will uh, succeed. Yeah, we are currently in the analysis phase for that, but we are very keen on spot urine. We also have, uh, in collaboration, developed another clinical training fellow of mine, a pediatrician, she has developed a new machine learning method, which can look at steroid ratios in spot urine, which is, uh, seems to perform in our testing similar to um, the 24-hour urine. So that's also uh, what we're going to apply here. Yeah, and Cushing, ACTH or not, wonderful. Yeah, like sort of, uh, yes, we, are, uh, we have a proof of principle study that is currently being written up and which I think we be, uh, showed at the European meeting and um, which actually shows that you can distinguish, you can both detect Cushing yes, no, and ACTH dependent versus independent with a steroid profile. with very high sensitivity and specificity. So um, we are uh, developing this further and that might uh, basically get rid of the terror of the ACTH assay at some point. Uh, Vipika, it's been such a privilege for me to listen to you talk uh, more than more, more than one occasion to hear the progress that you're making in this uh, uh, fantastic discovery. So many years ago, when we had calcitonin, the blood either went to Belfast or to Charing Cross, and it kind of worked. Now, for me, it goes to Merthyr Tidville. Um, so as this algorithm gets embedded in clinical practice, which is where you're you're driving towards. Do you see that this is something that should be available in every hospital or have you answered it by saying we should just pee yeah. onto a card or how many, what's the minimum number of centers that should be doing it? So like basically it's a complex essay. I can say this right. And um, basically um, James Hawley, he's a principal biochemist in Manchester, having been trained by Brian Kievel, who's one of the total world leaders in uh, multi-steroid profiling in the clinical biochemistry context. Yeah. And this is a training he has undergone already to do now his PhD. Yeah, like sort of, so the answer is no, it will not be at every hospital because it will not work. We have now standards for this test. We can share it with centers and the plan is to share it with centers in Europe. Yeah, like sort of like, like whatever we have, we will have one center in Norway doing it for Scandinavia. Yeah, we will have one center in Italy, we will have one center in France. And the standards we use for the mass spec are NMR controlled. Yeah, and so and it's like sort of like a ring certification thing that's happening. So and only high expert centers can do this. And in the UK, we, we will do here, the plan is to do a spin out company that will deliver clinical service tests to the NHS, yeah, like for this test and for several other tests, um, which we are progressing because you need major expertise and we try to collaborate with other NHS um, centers, um, but they only want to measure one to four steroids. It's all very complex, very different, many personnel, what's that, you know, like sort of, and you need to have a high performance of the test to, so that it makes sense that you can refer back in the algorithm to the database. The good thing is about this also that um, if, the, if the patients that are submitted give valid information like age, sex, Hounsford unit, uh, and uh, size, um, then the algorithm can become better and better. Yeah, because it learns all the time. The more data you spin in, the better it is. What the machine algorithm has found. Do you understand the algorithm? 
Yes, yeah, it's not a black box. That's very important to Michael Beal and my other collaborators. Also here, Peter Tinio, fantastic machine learner in the um, in Birmingham. Michael Beal is also now in our Center for Systems <coughs> Modeling and Quantitative Biomedicine. It's not a black, black box thing, but it's an intelligent solution. This um, allows us also to look in then and say, which steroids give this answer? What I showed you about the fingerprint. In, in the black box method, as people call it, you just put data in and then you get something out, but that doesn't help you. And obviously, we use these methods also for mechanistic discovery. So I want to exactly see what is the signature, what is a fingerprint, and then take it from there. You can completely interrogate it. And so, like basically, but then you would need to, um, you, the essay has to be um, the same essay, yeah, the same standards the same measurements, because obviously it, it relates to measurements that have been fed in. Now like 3,000, 4,000 results have been fed in, but if this is measured with different machines, with different relationship of the steroids to each other, you would lose major sensitivity and specificity. I, I think there's a sort of unspoken feeling that having a, having a service which relies nationally on one center is a little bit high risk, because what if that no, guy gets COVID, what if that lab goes down there will be obviously several guys and several machines yeah like sort of um but what do we have currently you know like sort of we have like um ucl and kcl that do gcms without computer science yeah without machine learning algorithms so that means 20 percent less sense 20 percent less spec we can always send we can always send to norway if we're stuck can't we <laughs> no, obviously the, the first center that opens um, will be in the UK and most likely here on campus, so, so you don't have to go far. <laughs> <laughs> All right for London. Vipka, fantastic. Thank you so much for that presentation. You're more than welcome. <laughs>
That's quite a panicky situation. That's all occurred to us at least once, two, three times in our lives. And we're never going to forget that. And then the next step is, okay, fine, if we can manage the airway, what if we can't intubate? We have one go, can't get it, and two goes, starts to get a bit swollen with all of our attempts. And then we can't manage the airway. So there's a real fear amongst many anaesthetists, quite rightly, that this sort of uh, goiter would be very difficult to manage. This is the, what we hope to see. Um, this is a grade one intubation where you can see the whole, whole, whole vocal cords. This is a grade two where you can see half of it. Uh, grade three, uh, you can just see the epiglottis and not much else, but you can get a feeling that there's something just there that you can probably get the tube through. And this is what we really panic about, a grade four view where you cannot see anything. Unfortunately, that's pretty rare. Now in the normal population, uh, a grade three or four is about 10%. Okay, so uh, most people are grade one and two. So thyroid surgery is intubating in a patient with a goiter more difficult than in a normal population. And there's been lots of case series, some people quoting 20% difficult intubation rate, some quoting less than 5% difficult intubation rate. This is one of the bigger series, which sort of quoted about 11%, which is fairly similar to the normal population. And yeah, I, that's my inkling as well. It is fairly similar to the normal population. Although there is a big goiter, generally it's kind of below the laryngeal inlet. So even when that goiter is big, you should see the vocal cords fairly, fairly reasonably. Um, there's a lot of predictive airway assessments that we do when we go and visit the patient preoperatively, um, uh, opening their mouth, mouth and patty scores, depending on what you can see at the back, environmental distances, um, neck circumferences, various tests. And we looked at the, uh, a load of these tests and see if there was any predictive value in any of them in time to predict which ones would be difficult to intubate. Um, managed to present this in Buenos Aires in the World Congress of Anesthesia. One of my SHOs went on to have a nice jolly there. Um, but uh, so we did find that, okay, next circumference, environmental distance, and the goiter size, the goiter weight, may have some bearing in making uh, intubations slightly more difficult, varying towards grade threes. When we extended the series over a couple of years to about 131 patients, Unfortunately, we found that uh, things just aren't as predictable as we'd like. Um, um, we did find that the incidence of difficult ventilation and endotracheal tube intubation is fairly similar to the normal population, around 9-10%. But uh, apart from the body mass index, there were no other bedside tests that the anesthetist does that was predictive of a difficult intubation. We tried to come up with various scores, kind of amalgamating a few things like the size of the goiter plus the presence of stridor, difficulty swallowing, and, and so forth. But again, we couldn't find a score that would be of any value. Probably why I don't spend much time assessing the patients when I go and see them, and I know you always joke about it. Sometimes you see someone blatantly, oh my God, that might be difficult. It's unusual, um, and, and you just got to get on with it. So this is just a CT of someone that was presented to us uh, about two, three weeks ago. Try not to focus on the goiter too much, but what it does to the airway. It's not much deviation, but this goiter has got a big retrosternal component. And then looking at the airway, again, just seeing how, how it's narrowed down. And again, that's all above the queen. So that narrowing is roughly where the tip of our endotracheal tube will sit. And again, we've seen patients who are fairly easy to get the tube down, but we fly them flat, and somehow that obstructs against the side of the wall of that airway, and you can get kind of a no ventilation situation. So uh, just something to be aware of. All it needs is a bit of manipulating of the airway or manip manipulating of the ET tube, and it should be fine. I think our lives have become a lot easier uh, in the last 10 years. This is a standard uh, laryngoscope. Um, these are the endotracheal tubes that we use in general with the EMG uh, monitoring. Uh, the, this sits right in between the vocal cords so that we can stimulate the nerve and make sure that's not damaged during surgery. Um, and normally you're kind of peering down at the end around here 
um, and trying to get the tube in. in. Thanks to video endoscopes, I think that incidence of a 10% difficulty in intubation has vastly gone down. So these video laryngoscopes come in many forms. There's some with larger screens, uh, separately attached. Uh, this one's uh, McGrath. Oh, why didn't that play? So we can see the, the laryngoscope being inserted. We don't have to peer right up against the patient's mouth. We can just stand back. So that's good for COVID. Um, and you can see the, 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 the view being a sort of almost a grade one view now. And this undoubtedly would have been someone that would have been a grade two or three view with a standard laryngoscope. Like, yeah. So get the bougie in. There's an argument to using a video laryngoscope for everything now, because I think the key thing is getting that, uh, the, the electrodes for the nerve stimulation in the right place as well. And again, visualizing it so clearly helps. So we talked about the induction of anesthesia. Can we manage the airway? Can we intubate? But obviously if we have post-operative bleeding at the end, that can only make things worse because whether we got the tube in at the beginning or not is irrelevant because if we have bleeding at the end, once the tube is out, that may distort the anatomy even more. And that's something we really want to avoid But for a start. So how do we avoid it? It's, it's careful hemostasis. So when the thyroid gland is out, it's important to have a normal blood pressure, allowing the surgeon to cause, um, to, to basically uh, zap everything that needs to be zapped, tie off any vessels that are bleeding. In cases, we actually have a supernormal blood pressure. And I'll give a load of alpha agonists uh, and beta agonists to get the blood pressure up. If there's going to be bleeding, we find out at that time, particularly with the larger voices where there's going to be a lot of dead space. We do a head down to encourage any bleeding and a valve salvo to raise the intrathoracic pressure uh, to above um, uh, venous pressure. Again, just encouraging any bleeding at that stage. Once we've managed to secure hemostasis, everyone's happy, 10 minutes to close up. Uh, during that time, I get the patient to breathe for themselves. Now, normally the safest way to take an endotracheal tube out is for the patient to be wide awake uh, and, um, uh, and safely we can then take the tube out. But they're often coughing, gagging, coughing, gagging. Kind of dangerous to do that once you've just recently put some new sutures on, zapped something. Uh, yeah, the last thing we want is them coughing, gagging, raising pressure, venous pressure, causing further bleeding at that stage. Just when we're taking the tube out, the last thing we want is uh, a bleed at that stage. So um, again, it's a, a sort of a deep extubation. The slight dangers of a deep extubation are: can we manage the airway? Because you're actually taking the tube out uh, in a in a largely unconscious patients. Uh, and there's a tendency to the tongue to fall back and the airway to collapse. Again, manageable with some of the kit that we have, laryngeal mask, uh, Giddell airways, uh, and, and just a lot of experience with uh, a jaw thrust and airway maneuvers. So that's our airway. We sort of briefly cover breathing. Um, there's not much that we can say uh, that much interest within endocrine surgery, but with retroperitoneal uh, surgery, um, prone positioning does provide a bit of a challenge, um, in particular with the CO2 infiltration. So uh, high pressures are required. There's a lot of blood vessels in all the fat at the back. So there's a lot of CO2 absorption. So uh, on many occasions, we've ended up with patients with uh, PCO2s of 10, 12 at the end. Um, uh, is this a problem? I don't really think so. Uh, at the beginning, we used to worry about patients with respiratory disease, COPD, uh, is uh, giving them so much CO2 going to be a, a, a too much for them? Um, but the actual surgery tends to be quicker than laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the the analgesia requirements are minimal compared to laparoscopic, uh, and they have a much faster post-operative recovery period. So I think the advantages uh, are far greater than the disadvantages, the temporary disadvantages of CO2 absorption. So these are sort of typical readings of a patient who has have, uh, is having uh, uh, retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. Um, you can see that the PDCO2 is starting to rise. Uh, they're getting a respiratory acidosis. The pH is dropping. Um, uh, obviously, giving bicarb or something like that in this situation would be the worst thing you can do because that will just cause a buildup of further CO2. Um, 
uh, you can see on this slide, this is where we, um, the, the initial pressures, the airway pressures are low at 18. Uh, there's the end tidal CO2 is low, but with time, as we insufflate, the uh, peak pressures go up, the CO2 starts to go up. It's not a problem. We can manage this. We just have to go up on the respiratory rate. We can just uh, increase the minute ventilation, blow off that CO2. Sometimes we can't blow it off enough. We ask the surgeons, can you reduce the pressure of the CO2 a little bit? Possibly, or you just want them to get on with things as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. At the end, if we've got a CO2 of 12, 13, we just spend half an hour ventilating the patient, blowing off that CO2, and then waking up. Made the mistake once of not blowing off that CO2. So although the anesthetic had worn off, we unfortunately had a patient who had CO2 narcosis and was anesthetized to CO2. So above 12, we do have to be careful. And then it comes to the circulation. Um, so uh, hopefully this is probably the most interesting bit for many of the endocrinologists here. So uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about fear chromocytomas, um, which are, as you know, catecholamine secreting tumors uh, of the adrenal medulla, can be uh, secreting noradrenaline, adrenaline or dopamine. Um, and essentially we're dealing with its effects on alpha receptors and beta receptors. Um, and so what does that do to the body? Well, it, our body is a circuit, Ohm's law, V equals IR. Uh, so blood pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Your cardiac output is a product of your uh, stroke volume and your heart rate. And we're effectively looking at what the noradrenaline and dopamine is doing to these parameters. And most of the, your body, your, your sympathetic system is balanced by your parasympathetic system. Um, but in your vascular, uh, uh, um, in your, on your blood vessels, it's a balance of alpha and beta. Alpha vasoconstricts, beta vasodilates. What happens with pheochromocytomas, if, you're not, if they're untreated and they turn up to an anesthetic room, we're not suspecting they've got a pheochromocytoma, we bang off sleep. We're dealing with a patient who often has profound vasoconstriction. Um, and are relatively hypovolemic as well. So that's a, a potentially very dangerous situation. We then give them an anesthetic drug, uh, which tends to dilate them up a little bit. They're hypovolemic, a lot of hemodynamic st instability. We cause them stimulation with uh, laryngoscopy and intubation. Again, a big sympathetic surge. And we get this sort of horrible up and down of blood pressure, sometimes catastrophic. And again, something that anesthetists fear unless they do this day in, day out, and they're used to managing fear crowds so times. <clears throat> so um, how, do we, how do we make all of this sort of safe? Um, so the general consensus is that we uh, preoperatively blockade um, the alpha receptors so that the vasoconstriction is reduced. We also um, give them lots of fluid, uh, so they're not hypovolemic anymore. And essentially, it hopefully makes for a more smoother anesthetic. Or does it? So historically, we used to use intravenous phenoxybenzamine. Um, and I think that was probably a good 10 years ago that, uh, we, that they stopped making intravenous phenoxybenzamine. Um, from experience, it wasn't particularly reliable. Some were very well blocked, some were not blocked as well. And I did see blood pressures in excess of 200. There was one patient who had a reading of 320 systolic. Now, I don't know if that was real or not. I'm hoping it was just a hyper-resonant um, arterial line. Um, uh, and it was while I was putting in a, a central line um, with a, a bit of carotid stimulation, maybe. Um, the next thing gave a load of alpha blockade, blood pressure is 40 over 20. So it was a very yo-yo-y kind of anesthetic at the time. Um, I think with the use of longer acting oral phenoxybenzamine, things have been a lot more smoother. And I'll give you a few examples um, in a, in a, uh, uh, later on. But um, it, it, I think generally uh, things have become um, far more stable with the type of pre-op blockade that we're using. I think the uh, members of the team here 
Rose paper um, looking at the effectiveness of alpha beta blockade in pheochromocytoma um, uh, and whether um, uh, how effective the blockade is. They did find that even with the oral phenoxybenzamine, about 60% of the patients had still hemodynamic instability. Um, and their sort of conclusions were, you know, whether we should be blocking or not. Is it, is it of any relevance that, you know, even with blockade, uh, which um, they termed as optimum, even optimum blockade, uh, is, is, um, uh, is it, uh, is, is it worth doing kind of thing? Um, there were a few emissions on the author list as well. I'm not bitter. Uh, so um, it moves us on to the prescript trial, which is a randomized controlled trial. Finally, I'm sort of addressing some of the things that we've been talking about uh, in terms of blockade. Uh, this was carried out, I think, in the Netherlands, nine centers over five years, about 130 patients. Um, and it looks at the preoperative preparation comparing phenoxybenzamine and doxazosin. Phenoxybenzamine is a non-selective, non-competitive, long-acting alpha blocker. Doxazosin is a competitive, selective alpha-1 uh, blocker. So the, the phenoxybenzamine will also work on alpha-2 um, receptors, which sit presynaptively uh, and sort of acts as a feedback kind of uh, down-regulator of noradrenaline release. So there's a subtle difference in the drugs. Um, they pre-treated both, both arms with about 14 days. Uh, the doses were pretty high, 120 milligrams a day of phenoxybenzamine, uh, and very high for the doxazosin, 40 milligrams uh, a day on the day before surgery. Um, they were targeting blood pressures of 130 over 80, I think. So that's pretty sporting. And they were targeting heart rates of less than 80 in the supine uh, position. So a lot of them ended up having a calcium channel blocker as well, which is, I think, not our practice. And a high proportion, particularly in the phenoxybenzamine group, had uh, also a, a beta blocker added in. So the intraoperative targets were essentially keeping the blood pressure less than 160 systolic, uh, keeping the blood pressure a means above 60 millimeters of mercury, and a heart rate of less than 100. And the primary endpoint was basically the percentage of time that the patients had the parameters outside these, uh, these targets. Um, uh, and then secondary endpoints were this thing called the hemodynamic instability score, which the, that the authors themselves had sort of validated in previous uh, papers, uh, looking at things like blood pressure, heart rate, the amount of vasoactive drugs that the anesthetist has to give, the amount of fluids that we have to give, and then coming up with a score to sort of give you a marker of how unstable the patient was. And not surprisingly, um, there wasn't much difference. So the duration of blood pressure outside the target range was no different in the two groups. Um, the phenoxybenzamine was more effective in preventing intraoperative hemodynamic instability, but no real difference in outcome after that. The relevant points here were there was no placebo. I think that the, the team there felt that there was no equipoison uh, and they, they felt it would be unethical to give pa patients absolutely nothing. Um, we could probably talk about that later. Um, and they also sort of noted that if you were hypotensive uh, preoperatively, um, then, oh, it's not hypotensive, less than 130 over 80, then you may have slightly less hemodynamic instability. But if you were very hypotensive with a systolic pressure of less than 90 when you're um, upright, then that was associated with more hemodynamic <coughs> instability. That I think is in keeping with our, our sort of, uh, sometimes patients, our practice, sometimes the patients come over blocked almost, and you're fighting just to keep the blood pressure up all the time. So I think over blocking is bad for you. Under blocking, probably bad for you. Getting it right is great, but what is getting it right, don't know. Does it matter? I don't think so. Um, I might be on my own here, but anyway, the body is a circuit, as I said, V equals IR. We've got lots of drugs. We've got lots of drugs that can manipulate this. I've got a whole cupboard full of it. The first thing is that we've got all of these, which are 
essentially uh, downers, and then all of these that are uppers. So these all increase your heart, uh, blood pressure, these all decrease your blood pressure. The most notable one is propofol. So anesthesia drops your blood pressure. Um, Remifentanil, opioids that we often commonly use, again, drops your blood pressure. Also intravenous phenoxybenzamine is no longer available. So we tend to use intravenous phentolamine, which works marvelously, works within 30 seconds as an alpha antagonist, will basically vasodilate or block your alpha receptors that are vasoconstricting. So we'll vasodilate the patient, will last about five minutes and then wear off. So while the surgeon is prodding the adrenal gland, trying to dissect it, lots of catecholamine surges coming out, you just give little boluses of phentolamine and it will just minimize any of the surges that we see. Uh, a lot of my obstetric colleagues like obstetric anesthetists are familiar with using magnesium, particularly in preeclampsia, hypertension. And again, it's effective in adrenal, uh, adrenal surgery in that it dampens the amount of catecholamines released. And again, is of some value in suppressing uh, that high blood pressure. Can use intravenous nicardipine, uh, which is a calcium antagonist. Some of my cardiac anesthetic colleagues are used to using GTN and sodium nitroprosylide as nitric oxide donors. Again, good vasodilators. Um, and we can use beta blockers as well, again, but again, bearing in mind what beta receptors do to your systemic vascular resistance. Remember, beta dilates, so blocking your beta receptors may not be a good thing. But if they're tachycardic and malignant and tachycardic, i.e. when above 120, 130, then one could consider using bilobesmolol. The great thing about all of these drugs, they're short acting. So if we're getting it wrong, it's all going wrong, just stop it and use another drug. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to manipulate uh, the, the high blood pressures that we see uh, and safely do it. Um, once the adrenal gland is out, that catecholamine infusion has been stopped, um, our biggest problem is actually keeping the blood pressure up. Um, uh, we can use alpha agonists, such as metramidol and noradrenaline, um, uh, but you end up having to use five, 10 times as much as you're normally used to. Again, it makes the anesthetist a bit nervous. All your alpha receptors are blocked, so giving it in small aliquots just doesn't work. You have to give just big um, industrial doses to overcome that blockade. What do we do in septic shock when our Alpha, our noradrenaline is not working, profound septic shock. Um, well, we use, vas we, we go to the V1 receptor, so vasopressin or terlipressin. And again, for refractory hypotension, uh, tends to work uh, just, uh, just to treat. And also, you know, bearing in mind the alpha receptors are blocked. Um, yeah, if, if the alpha agonist isn't working, then we can go to another receptor, which, which will, again, bring up the blood pressure without problems. So again, is having the patient optimally blocked of any value? I think it is of some value. What is optimal blocking? I don't know. Uh, it's gonna be different for every different patient, depending on how much catecholamine they're secreting, uh, what their receptors are doing, up regulation, down regulation. It's incredibly difficult to predict. But whatever it is, I think we can uh, manage in, in the anesthetic room, when in theaters. So this is a sort of a classic uh, patient uh, that had a retroperitoneal adrenalectomy. Um, the patient did give uh, uh, permission to, to use this chart. Um, and you can see for a beginning, her blood pressure is about 160 over 100 in the, uh, as she comes in. Um, uh, interestingly, in the prescript trial, they would cancel or postpone patients who had blood pressure of over 160 over 110. Um, I think if we did that, we would probably be canceling at least 20 or 30% of patients. So, um, uh, which may make some of my colleagues happy, but uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, so the first thing you notice, uh, we give the anesthetic and uh, the patient becomes profoundly hypotensive, all their alpha receptors are, are, are blocked, uh, and we've just given them a load of propofol and inhalation, which vasodilates even more. So they're kind of profoundly hypotensive. And we're talking sort of around 80 systolics. I don't want them to get too low. They're used to a high blood pressure, you know, too low a long period of time, kidney perfusion and all sorts of other factors get, get affected. So we want that to yeah, be uh, as minimal as possible. 
you can see just moving on back into once we're on the table doing the surgery this is where the uh, that sort of a, the gland's been dissected a lot of prodding pushing uh, catecholamine surges so we get some surges up to nearly 200 but all very manageable a few boluses of metro, um, uh, fentolamine uh, and it all comes fine um, and then we get to the point where the adrenal vein is clamped uh, and then that catecholamine infusion has been stopped uh, and again profound hypo um, uh, hypotension for uh, the duration until the end uh, once we wake them up everything reverses there was a little period here where we um, didn't have any blood pressure readings. <clears throat> I think the good professor decided to take out the arterial line when we were proning the patient um, and uh, gave me the sort of added challenge of trying to get an arterial line in a patient who is hypotensive, so I can't feel the pulse, and in a, in a prone position. So the challenges never keep on stopping. This one I thought I'd mastered it. There's, uh, another challenge anyway look we've talked about the airway the massive goiter the post-operative bleeding i think that's all largely manageable particularly with the advent of video laryngoscopes uh, but do bear in mind when they come into clinic when they have the scans what effect the big goiter is having on the air on the airway itself uh, whether it's deviated whether the airway is compressed it's just good to know for us rather than ah uh, we're not doing it Second thing is breathing. Again, the CO2 absorption uh, can be a problem, but effectively isn't. We just need to be aware that it occurs and be patient, uh, let you get on with the surgery, uh, and then we can just uh, hyperventilate the patient and manage it after. And finally, the circulation. You know, as someone that deals mainly with intensive care patients, um, where we, you know, dealing with septic shock, 40% uh, of our patients die of refractory hypotension. Having a high blood pressure is actually a nice problem to have. So, and it's manageable. I have drugs for that. Whereas in septic shock, you know, there's still uh, a lot of unknowns and, uh, and, and, and tragically there's, uh, you yeah, know, there's stuff that I can't treat. I want to just add in a bit of D, E and F to this. Uh, so dynamic teamwork. It is important that we all talk to each other. We are used to working with each other. Um, uh we have long days we have long cases at times sometimes they're short but we're used to doing it um i'm not sure why i put this slide up but i just thought i'll make a note of the time there when we finished experience um i wasn't angry <laughs> uh experience is uh very important uh you've known for a while that surgical volume um, uh, throughput of, uh, of, of centers um, uh, has a big out, um, impact on, on the uh, outcomes. Uh, we've known this for many years. Um, I'm not going to say, oh, we should only do these things in high volume centers or in, you know, uh, in teaching hospitals or whatever, or we need to do a certain amount every year. But it's more about, I think, with that experience comes familiarity. Um, we're used to the routine of what happens during this, uh, this, uh, this, these operations. I'm far more comfortable managing a large patient with a difficult airway who's having a fear chromocytoma. Uh, I'm far more comfortable anesthetizing for that than I am for a fit and well patient who's having a knee arthroscopy. It's just what I do day in, day out. It doesn't make me any better or worse than my colleagues. It's just what we do day in, day out. And I think that really does help in getting good outcomes. Uh, again, along with that, just knowing what the routine is, knowing where, how we turn patients, those sort of things. Flexibility, some patients take one hour to operate, some take four or five hours, we know that. Camaraderie is crucial. Um, uh, ownership of the patient, it's, um, you know, I, we feel part of the team. Um, if patients have complications, whether they be the rare rebleeds or um, whatever else may occur afterwards, we're involved. We want to change our practice to make sure that that's up to a minimum. Um, and, and, you know, it's all about the teamwork. We're motivated to provide a good service. Um, we now have, um, you know, good experience of this. Um, and I think as a Result, I think everyone that works in that particular theatre uh, are, are pretty enthusiastic. Um, I'd like to also thank the nurses, the ODPs, the HCAs that again have sort of helped us kind of 
manage these patients. Um, it makes our day when the right nurses, the right HCAs that are used to dealing with this sort of particular thing are there. It, it makes a big difference, although it's a difficult difference to measure, it's a huge difference. Um, and finally, it's been a pleasure. I've been doing this for 17 years. <sighs> God, I'm going to have to retire soon. <laughs> so, so thank you. Hi, Freddie, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I've got to ask Fausto to comment first. Well, first of all, I've got to say um, it's a privilege to have been working with you for 18 years. So you missed out a year there. Yeah. And, uh, and all, I just want to echo everything you've said and uh, how important it is to have familiarity and teamwork. It's just, um, I, I can't underline. If you're a creature of habit, which most surgeons are, if, if, well, I've just found out what he's been doing, by the way, at the other end of the table for the last 18 years. I didn't know. Um, but it, but it's, it's, any change makes, certainly makes me unsettled. So the familiarity is incredibly important. While you're thinking of your questions, the microphone around, let me make a comment to the trainees. I think there's one opportunity you have in your training to get to theatre. As a consultant, it's much harder. But I think if you witness one adrenalectomy, and spend half your time at the top end and half your time peering over the surgeon's shoulder with their agreement. Changes your view for your consultant career. I think it's really good to go to theatre to see transphenoidal surgery once, parathyroid surgery once, adrenal surgery once, talk to the anaesthetist, work out what's going on, kind of share it for an hour or two, last you forever. Is that a reasonable thing to suggest, Fausto, or is that, you know, don't treat surgery like a black box. They go and then they come back. You know, I think you have to you have to be there at least at least once just to, to savor it. Don't or don't pick the one that finishes at eight. Perrin, that was great. Um, you you've probably had this discussion with Fausto. We've had a lecture in here about no drugs during surgery for Theo. Any comment? The no no drugs at all. No no blockade and no uh, fluoxetine or any anything in. And it was, during, in this, during, it, it during was in this room that we talked about it. It was quite, quite dramatic. So, One of so, Fausto's colleagues is very keen on that. And he's got good, good outcomes with, with his patients. But. Yeah, so, so I, I'm a big fan of an RCT. If we could do something like that, I think we would. So when, when we say no preoperative blockade, it's not completely no preoperative blockade. They're going to be on some form of antihypertensive, probably doxazacin in the community. And you can encourage them to make sure they drink a reasonable amount in the run-up to surgery. You might want to up-titrate their, their doxazacin to a little bit. Um, and then they turn up with whatever pressure they turn up with. Not a problem. For me, I would say, okay, fine. We would just gently give them the anesthetic, do things in a more gentle manner. As I said, we've got drugs intraoperatively that we can use. Um, and I think we can safely anesthetize that patient, knowing what to expect. Um, uh, I think the advantages of that would be not having to bring them into uh, hospital for three days. I think the study, the prescript study, noted that you know, patients that have got a systolic less than 90 actually also had a, a half, far, far worse hemodynamic instability. So I think there's a tendency to sometimes overblock patients, which is potentially harmful as well. So my view would be, look, we know what we're dealing with. We have drugs that can make patients' blood pressures go up and down. We have a very controllable situation. I think as long as they're not arriving to us profoundly vasoconstricted and hypovolemic, that it's manageable. Which makes me want to ask, is there anything you'd like us to do better? Because you've got a room for people who'll be... No, and I think, I, I think, I don't think there is a, I, I, I don't think there is a, at the moment, an optimum way of blocking patients. We, we just see so much variation uh, in their blood pressures and they arrive to the anaesthetic room and they all roughly have the same cocktail, the same doses. Um, so I, I don't, we don't know what, what's happening to the alpha and beta receptors, how many of each they've got. Uh, what particular cascolamine they're secreting at that particular moment and what effect that's having on the receptors. So there's a lot of unknowns. So I think, I, I think the key thing is do a bit of pre-op preparation. Uh, a bit is better than nothing, but too much is probably worse than a bit. 
and accept what we what you've done and and yeah we can i think manage it and it's a temporary situation it's not like a a thing that goes on once the adrenals out problem almost solved you get that hypotensive period but within six hours it's all resolved you're clearly very tolerant of whatever nature throws your way amy uh, thanks, Perrin. That was a really fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'd just like to echo what Fausto said, that I cannot overstate how incredibly reassuring it is when everything is it's a little bit challenging surgically and you look up and see your cool, calm and collected presence at the top end, unfazed by anything. We can deal with it in uh, red capitals. And um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about the airway stuff that you mentioned at the beginning. So, again, I think typically of your cool, calm and collected attitude, your approach is logical to me i if in a patient with an extremely large and compressive goiter the endotracheal tube can be passed through the cords then you're pretty much okay and the rest can be managed but i do see in in other centers and particularly when we go abroad and converse with our colleagues a lot of anxiety about what happens with those distal narrowings beyond the tip of the et tube and people talking about bypass and all yes all kinds of uh, very exciting things that certainly I've never understood the logical need for. And I, with your 18 years of experience, wanted to know your thoughts. So these are extrinsic compressions on the airway. Um, they're not like the stuff that we used to deal with at, uh, when I was working at Grayson Road, for the, the sort of the airway cancers themselves. So if you can pass the endotracheal tube, it'll generally open up, it will stent open that airway and you're taking away the compression. So I've not come across many that we have not been able to manage with a, a standard approach. Again, just knowing what to expect, but having a look at the imaging beforehand, knowing that, okay, I might have to stick the ET tube a little bit further in, which may have a consequence on the, on the EMG, on the, on the thing, but yeah, look, this is what we might have to do. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I mean, my dream is, you saw how easy it is with the video laryngoscope. So my dream is that I think the, so I just get the surgeons and, you know, get the tube in and I can just spend more time in the coffee room. I, that's, that's the way I see the future of anesthesia going. Thank you. Call me if there's a problem. Fantastic. That was absolutely amazing. We're truly in awe of the work you do. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know that phrase when people introduce a speaker? I really hate it, but I'm going to use it right now. That phrase, the next speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> I can't introduce my colleague here in this setting. He can jolly well introduce himself. Indeed, Karim. I can, but I'm not going to introduce myself because, as you said, I need no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been great having all the discussion. So I'm sorry I'm so far behind, but I think it's worth it because the interactive nature of this meeting is really, I think, crucial. And I want to tell you a little bit of, I mean, the, thank you for the title, Gareth, though, Tales uh, from, and he called it a T3 clinic, but in fact, it's a T3 withdrawal clinic that we set up because there's been a number of changes I'll tell you a bit about now. So really, it's about rationalizing withdrawal of T3 in patients who are very symptomatic. And this is a big problem that a lot of us have. Okay. So the things I want to tell you about are, first of all, the dangers of the term trials of therapy, because although it's all over the place, you try a drug, if it works, keep going. What is missing from that is the control arm, the placebo effect, which also occurs. And if you give someone a trial of therapy and they believe it, then it works. And in fact, I'll, I'll show some literature, but there is no evidence of any benefit of lathyrin over thyroxine. And the other thing that I'm sure you've heard about is there's a gene for this. Um, and I've looked into this in a lot of detail, and I found the SNP that people are talking about and that particular gene. And in fact, the truth is there isn't any evidence for that gene at all. Um, and I'll show you the data that has been misquoted. Um, and the problem really is that patients with tiredness and depression are very vulnerable to being manipulated by various things, private practitioners, websites. And what we need to do is be on their side, because the problem is they don't trust us because we, we haven't got good data. But in fact, there is plenty of data, we just ignore it. And the other really important thing is we've got to maximize our financial efficiency on drug spend and giving people drugs that don't work in the NHS is really not justifiable. If you give someone lifetime, someone else doesn't get a renal transplant, that, that's the kind of thing. 
we're talking about. So this is my made up graph of well-being against time and time is variable on this. OK, but we've all got good and bad days, good and bad weeks. And this is kind of what happens with, with time. Okay? What happens is if you're tired, when you are really, really at your utmost low, you then think, right, I'm going to seek for help. I'm going to start some random substance, coenzyme Q, placebo, see a private doctor, because I'm desperate, I'm going to pay money. Okay? Whatever that person does causes improvement. Okay? Whatever, placebo or whatever. So then what happens is it starts to wear off because it's a random effect. And so then when they're really feeling unwell, they go back to see their private doctor who says, double the dose. And it works, okay? So this is a big problem with trials of therapy because you only try things when you're really struggling. And when you're really struggling, you're likely to improve, okay? And this is a big problem that you see. Now, our CCG commissioned a teeth withdrawal clinic because of the huge expense um, of teeth that was going on. Now, most patients who are referred to this clinic, it's, it's labeled teeth withdrawal. Um, some people come to it because they want T3. They're already on it and they want the NS to take over the prescription is usually the story. Um, they're mostly on a dose of E4 between 50 and 150, and they're on a very variable dose of T3. Some are on 2.5 once a day, and others are on 43 times a day. So enormous range of treatment. And when you start asking other drugs, some of them are on of thyroid, but I've learned some new drugs that are out there, ashwagandha, okay? New, it's been around a long time, very high prevalence of ashwagandha use in T3 patients, okay? Same with turmeric, same with coenzyme Q. And these are, there's a new word I learned called adaptogen. They say they're adaptogens, and it's all over it. What's an adaptogen? Doctor, what is an adaptogen? An adaptogen is a drug that works for what your body needs, whatever it might be, tiredness, <laughs> headache, fever. It just works for that problem. It's an adaptogen. It's a great word, okay? Now, when they come to the clinic, they are still tired. I mean, that's a really important point. They're on T3, and they're still tired. They're not saying, this is great. They say, I'm still tired. If you, if you spend time with them, if you rush them through it, they'll say, well, when I, before I stopped by T3, I was fantastic. I'm terrible. If you go through it very carefully, your question is, so it's time consuming these clinics, okay? But it's definitely worth it because you then get a rapport with them because that's what happens in other settings. They, they're given time to tell you about all their problems, okay? So you get these various supplements that are on ashwagandha, turmeric, all available, and it's not cheap even at Boots, coenzyme Q, okay, at Boots, 38 pounds, well, and that's an offer, okay. <laughs> now, the problem is they are really scared to stop there, whatever they're on. So here they come along, and I say, uh, you, should, you can come off, you don't need this, and they go, no, doctor, I'm really tired. I'm not going to stop it now because I'm too tired. I'll wait till I'm better, okay. And then when they're better, they say, okay, I'll stop it now. And lo and behold, stopping T3 is associated with the worsening of their symptoms. So that is another effect of this trial of therapy and trial of stopping, because you won't stop it if you think you're not feeling well. So this is life, okay? And they tell you about chronic fatigue and brain fog, and I listen to them. You've got to listen to them and take on board all of their problems, because a lot of them are also having the right treatment, like talking therapies. I'm calling these things placebos, that's coenzyme Q, ashwagandha, and so on, okay? And there's nothing wrong with placebo effect, right? But if you're paying for treatment, I would like an additional benefit on top of the placebo. So I look at the history of hypothyroidism. Now, amazingly, some of them don't have hypothyroidism at all. They are completely normal, but they had symptoms of hypothyroidism. Someone said, let's do a trial of thyroxine. And guess what? They feel better for the brief I've just told you. And once you're on thyroxine, you have a TSH that so might be a bit lower in the reference range, no one's going to stop it. So your GP keeps it going. And then you have a labeled clear diagnosis of confirmed hypothyroidism. And guess what? You get all your drugs for free because you have a FP92. You're exempt. Okay. And that's another reason to not give people thyroxine when they don't need it. But they're still tired. They're scared to stop their drugs. So it carries on. So what do I do? I tell them, well, look, they all, most of them, when they come, have a suppressed TSH, okay, because they're all on too much. So we talk about the risks and benefits, and many say they don't care. I don't care about the risks. I want to have a happy life, okay? So I offer them regular, I say, look, we'll monitor your T3, and they want lots of blood tests. They always ask about reverse T3, and I tell them that's no point in doing that. We can't do it. Some of them, I've had two or three patients, agree with me to do a blind trial, okay? And I'll show you some data in a minute, and then a couple of individuals. 
A lot of them need some auto placebo, okay? And I've looked around for auto placebos. Selenium is in the literature, okay? It's all over it, okay? And that's not, that's not a harmful, it's again expensive, but there's a cheap form, and that's Brazil nuts. Okay, this works, technology, okay? It's just, it's just a cheap placebo. Um, and in fact, you can go to, you can get cheaper. If you, can, if you don't go to Holland and Barrett, which is a real rip off area, look for the same thing, 14 pound a night, you get it for one pound 45. And just for um, fairness, I'll include as, the, as well as Sainsbury's, okay? But basically, it's cheap, and they have, according to the web, 90 micrograms of, of uh, selenium each. So you need one Brazil nut daily. Fantastic placebo. Now, let me show you some data. The GHQ-12 is the general health questionnaire 12. There are 12 questions, okay? And they're positive or negative. And the score for each of them is naught to three, okay? So if you are better than usual, you get zero. And if you're worse than usual, you get three. And there are 12 questions. And of course, if it's a negative question in italics, then you reverse the scale. But basically, if you're a really happy person, you score zero. And if you're absolutely knackered, you get 36, okay? And that's how this question, you've got all the questions, and it's a self-administered, but it's administered in lots of studies. And it was used in a number of studies. Here's a good study looking at patients with hypothyroidism compared to control. So healthy volunteers um, in white. And you'll see, so they did, this is their tiredness score on that scale of 0 to 36. So there's a few people who are not tired at all, and a very small number are really knackered, but most of them score about 10. And you'll see that the mean score of healthy people is 11.39, and those on pyroxid have a slightly higher tiredness score of 12. Is that significant? Well, it is if you use p-values, but is it clinically significant? That's a good question. The other thing you'll notice, in the really non-tired people, there are more people on pyroxid, and similarly, if you look for it, you'll find that the reverse is true in this particular one random group. So it's not a very consistent message, but it does seem there is a mark of tides. But I'm showing you this not because of the T4 effect, but because of the wider the scale and how it's been used subsequently, which I'll show you now. So a really good study done um, in, in Cardiff is, in fact, the Western area, T4, T3, third, and it's called Watts, W-A-T, yes. They had 573 people. They were asked to drop their dose of thalcum by 50, and they were given a capsule that contained either the same thalcum back in other words, placebo, or some T3. And it was probably done, and most importantly, it was blind and randomized. And they did the same GHQ, 0 to 36, okay? And what did they find? Amazing effect of both placebo and the T3. And for 12 months, there is no difference in the outcome, but they all got better. The times was 30.5, they all went down to about 11. So being in a study, Fantastic to see if it really works, okay? And they commented, okay, there's no evidence of benefit of giving T3 over T4, and there is a large and sustained placebo effect. Very clear, okay? At that time, T3 cost four pounds a month and T4 cost one pound a month. So not a huge difference, but if you're gonna use drugs that work, why not use a cheaper agent? Repeated and then looked at lots of studies, proper uh, meta-analysis, no evidence benefit at all. Conclusion, T4 monotherapy should remain the hypnotic choice. So there is the evidence. What is the question? Well, let's re-examine the data again and again and again. But this is what happened. The price of T3 then went up because one company basically, now we know illegally because they're under investigation, the CMA is going to find them or has fined them. But they put the cost up ridiculously, 250 pounds. This is when we start getting commissions. So actually it's cheaper to pay someone to run a clinic because every patient you stop saves the country 2,000 pounds a year. Okay, so that was the cost benefit analysis. That was still very cheap at 150 um, for a month's supply at the time, okay? And at that point, the NHS released several things. But first of all, primary care should not initiate T3. And GPs should not take on prescribing patients initially for T3 in private clinics, okay? Because, of course, the placebo effect and the cost was astronomical. Then this happened, okay? So this is a paper which reanalyzed what I've just shown you, and they looked at a specific SNP, okay? And I'll go through it in detail, but they basically looked at a polymorphism within this felt. They reanalyzed the same data and looked at the questionnaires again with T4 and T3 and looked at which ones because they could, of course, analyze the genes afterwards, okay? Now, let me explain what happens. What you do is you take your 500 people and you sequence loads and loads of different SNPs, 
and you look for how many have got. So let's say in this group here, right, this is a tiredness score of the 399 people who have a common homozygote. Heterozygotes about the same, minor homozygotes, slightly different, but there's no trend there, and so it's not significant. Easy. You do that again and again and again. And then if you do 20 studies, you're going to find what's significant. Is this significant? The tiredness goes in this SNP. There's 223 people who have got the TT genotype. 236 have got heterozygotes. And then 87 are homozygote for the other variant. It's a normal variant, but they've got the other one. And they said, oh, there's a trend. As you have more of this gene, as if there's a dose effect, you get more tiredness and it's significant. This is, this is wrong statistics. This is not how you statistics to look at tiredness. And the variance is tiny, okay? So what they looked at, here is the tiredness score on page again. Okay, you've got less tired and stayed less tired. Let's break it down by these three groups. Okay, so here we are. So now we've got the TT, the tiredness, as you go from this group, TT, to TC, to CC, you have a significant increase in tiredness. That is it, okay? That is it. And on that basis, they're saying, well, if you've got this gene, then maybe T3 will work. I mean, you look at the, the change in tiredness. If you have this gene, it's a small number, okay? And there's no error bars. So that's not significant. You, you can't say it is or not, because there's no error bars. But they said, look, the tiredness got much better if you had this gene compared to, to T4. So they said, although in the control group, there's no difference in this particular subgroup patients. So if you've got the gene, then it works for you, okay? So of course, it was done by a lot of very famous people. The exon they're talking about results in a threonine to anine substitution at position 92. I'll tell you what I'm saying in a minute. But what they said was, because it was a derived data study where they've analyzed data again, they say, we've got this again. Our results require replication. That suggests maybe there's some association with impaired psychological well-being, okay? How do the websites interpret that, okay? To explain the paper briefly, briefly, although the body gets enough T3, the brain doesn't, okay? And really importantly, they say, remember, all digests are normal with variant gene. So get the gene test, okay? Now come to Gene Alliance and we will check your gene, only 200 pounds, okay? And then we can, so they misquote the paper, okay? Because it hasn't been repeated yet, but of course, thousands of patients go and have this gene done. And whatever gene they have, they get this long spiel of stuff, they don't understand it, but they say, I've done the gene. Even if they've got the TT or the TC, they come on and say, I've had the gene done, I've got it. They haven't got it, because it's not the one that causes the CC, so it's completely wrong. So then it has been repeated now much more recently. So this is looking at three groups, T4, this is armor thyroid, desiccated thyroid extract, and a combination of T4 and T3. And it was a well-done blind crossover study and they, all patients got all, all groups, okay? So prop, the 22 weeks of each thing, T4 alone, DTE, and then combination. Okay, so that all the patients had all um, outcomes on the way to the end. And by the end, there were 75 people who stayed in the study. And what did they find? They didn't do the, just the GHQ12. They did 10 questionnaires. On all of them, no significant difference between T4, desiccated thyroid tract, or a combination, okay? So in a blind study, there is no evidence of that repeated. The reason I showed you that, though, is they've also looked at the tiredness gene, the same study, and they took the, they took the groups and they divide them the same way into very tired people um, and not very tired people, okay? And so if you look at these people, these people were the very tired ones, the highest score, okay? And when they were tired on T4, they said they preferred something else. Whereas those who are not tired, if you take a group who are tired, they're going to say, I want the other drug. That's not proof that the T4 doesn't work, okay? But really importantly, they did do the same gene analysis and found no effect at all of the gene. When you repeat the study, it didn't come across. It only happened that one study, and it was not significant. So basically, I think we have a duty to protect these vulnerable patients, okay, from these expensive and harmful placebos. It might be T3, it might be vitamins. I mean, one is a harmless placebo like vitamin D, okay? That's a harmless placebo. Um, the problem is patients don't like the word placebo. They want to believe that it's real, okay? But the thing is, if you spend resources on unproven treatments, somebody else doesn't get something that really works. This is the protocol that I use to help people come off it. It's fully very colorful. It's very gradual. They believe they need, this is the DTE protocol, okay? They're on 60, it's not micrograms, it's some funny unit. 
And I say to them, well, on Thursday, you halve your dose. And the following week, you take half twice and you gradually reduce the dose. It's all psychological, but if they get the chance it slowly and you monitor them and you hold their hand, you can get them off it completely and it usually works. But they often need a bit of hand holding as they go. Here is one of the patients, and I'll tell you a terrible story. This, okay? this patient here was seeing a private doctor in October 20th. So this is lockdown time. And of course, as a completely suppressed TSH and is on T3. And I basically took us the protocol and you can see TSH slowly coming up. And by this point, off T4 and off T3. So guess what? She is euthyroid on no drugs, okay? She feels tired. She feels very tired. She comes this evening, I say, look, your blood tests are absolutely perfect. She finds that paper says, I'm tired, your brain's not getting enough T3, but she's euthyroid throughout, okay? A little bit of vitamin D deficiency, perhaps. So she feels very tired, and she then goes back to your private doctor. It's an incredible story, this, okay? I was very interested to catch up with her progress after an interval of a year. In that time, she's been under care of Professor Marianne, who's carried out the maneuver of a trial of which all blood hormone support started in May this year. Blood hormone was all as well established, blah, blah, blah. The test has climbed now 1.8, which is the highest we've ever recorded, okay? <laughs> TSH at 1.8. Unfortunately, symptoms of heart problems have developed within weeks of stopping, okay, to the point where data function is severely impaired. This is a difficult conundrum. I don't think it is, but it's for him it is, okay, where the biochemistry is unremarkable, symptoms are quite severe. My interpretation of the TSH reading may still not be representative after a year of being on nothing, okay? And it might be for six or 12 months before. And then he says, I think the, the price is too great, and therefore I recommend intervening with a new prescription for thyroid hormones. And then he says, give a T4 and T3, because last time I tried it, the T4 didn't work. And then at the GP, thank you for this prescription, who wrote to me saying, what shall I do? Can I prescribe it? So I pointed out that if private clinics initiate T3, we cannot uh, recommence it. It's very tricky. This is another patient who wanted me to help, and I gave her that same questionnaire, okay, and she was wanted a placebo control trial. So these are my placebos. I've basically got them, put them in different bottles, and these are the options. This is the tiredness score on a different scale. Basically, um, it's the opposite of before. So a high number is really happy, and a low number is really tired. So she has bottles labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and she starts off with, she doesn't know what's in it. She's on her standards of thyroxine, and she's also on whatever's in this bottle. This is her TSH, T3, and T4. And she takes selenium, which does nothing. She takes lactose, which is placebo. She then has a bit of T4, an extra bit of T4, taking up to 187.5. And of course, your TSH will fall slightly when you do that, but it wasn't supposed to cause hyperthyroidism. She then tried Pro Plus with some glucose, okay? And that maybe slightly improved. She then has T3. 10 micrograms encapsulated and of course the TSH falls and the T3 goes up a bit but she doesn't feel any better at all. Then back on selenium, then she goes on holiday. Look what Spain does, okay? Massive improvement in, uh, in tiredness scores. And then she tries something else. So I pointed out this as a placebo and went through with her, okay? And, she, and she, this is what she's writing on. Over and fatigue is happening all the time, okay? And um, the problem is that this patient believes that the tiredness is caused by what she calls her thyroid condition, but it isn't, okay? She has hypothyroidism and she has tiredness that varies with what's happening else in life. Now, a final warning, and that is that if you don't do a blind study, it is completely useless, okay? This is a randomized, difficult, expensive study, but they didn't blind it, okay? Very simply, they measured and had a very peculiar, they didn't use any of the validated scores at all. They just, had, they just had scores for physical, mental, and then add them together to call total fatigue, okay? And they're on pyroxene once daily, and they say, right, we'll take, keep taking on thyroxine for another month, and then switch to five micrograms of T3 three times daily. So it's a totally different thing, and the tiredness improves, okay? And they published that saying, this proves that T3 may be helpful. We recognize a possible placebo effect, but we thought it was worth publishing anyway, okay? And of course, you get into journals like Front. This is what worries me about Frontiers, and it makes me think that it's not a very good journal because they take anything. Okay, and so they, but the good thing about that study is they also tried the gene, and again, they said, paradoxically, the only difference was the presence of that gene 
um, in Dunn Mays was a lower score in contrast T4, indicating improved quality of life. This result is in contrast with the hypothesis that this on most may impair. So basically, they said the gene doesn't work, uh, but T3 does, but it's not blind. So non blind studies are misleading, so be very careful. And that's exactly the same problem with, with um, giving patients a trial of therapy. We mustn't do it. So there's my summary, okay? There is no evidence at all about over T3 over T4. There is a very good and profound placebo effect that's widely carried out. People are taking advantage of vulnerable patients and trial therapy are completely flawed. What we have to do is a slow wean, explain the risks, explain the placebo effect, and uh, take patients off T3. Great, thank you very much. Hard time. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Karim. I, I think I probably know the answer to this question, but I wanted to just confirm it. So sometimes you see patients coming in with, with lots of kind of uh, Excel spreadsheets, and, and they've been told by a private clinician that uh, the ratio between their free T4 and their T3 is X or Y, or and how you can read something into that. And I, I've always been very cynical of that. I just want you to maybe confirm my cynicism. I think first. you should be cynical. I think there's a lot of salary stuff going on where they're measuring lots of other things and reverse T3 is very popular. And if the number suits the prescriber's uh, habit, they'll go, yes, that's, this proves that you need the drug. And in general, there's a lot of money being made. Some, 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 some of these practitioners actually believe it themselves. Okay, they're not all evil. They actually believe that it works. Yeah. Um, but there's an enormous placebo effect. So I haven't found any evidence of any of those. Remember, they're not... Uh, labs are not validated. We be very quick, careful with those. Thank you. Kareem, first of all, thank you for the work that you've done. I mean, I think you should be knighted, but you might be asked where you're really <laughs> from if you go to Buckingham Palace. Um, I just wanted to ask two questions. One is that the BES recently came out with a statement which people found quite confusing, given the fact that that same speaker at about one month before said there's absolutely no evidence for it. And it suggested that there have been some special pleading from private doctors. Um, my questions are, do you think that was helpful? And the other thing is some of these, um, G, the GHQ question, uh, score that you used, what's the mean for a population? So are these patients just generally sicker? Um, and one slightly controversial question, if there are people here who do do private medicine, are you going to stop prescribing T3? Okay, some good questions there. So, so, so first of all, um, the evidence for those, so the questionnaire, the GHQ questionnaire has been invalidated and the average score of a healthy person is 11.39. So you're right, there's, there's a huge variance in tiredness. My feeling is that there is bias in even that, that small difference. Just being on paroxysm, it's not because of paroxysm, there's some other bias that we haven't thought of. And that's very hard to prove or disprove. But that's a, that's a big problem. I do think we should all stop prescribing T3 at the moment. Having said that, the price is coming down. And so when it comes down to four pounds a month again, uh, it might be that people feel justified in prescribing. They can buy it. In fact, at the moment, about three quarters of patients buy it from two sources, uh, one online and one in um, Turkey. So it's, it's, it's bought, okay? DT is not regulated. And the problem is, SK thyroid extract comes from pigs, porcine T uh, thyroxine. Pigs have a much higher T3 than humans, so the ratio of T3 to T4 is much higher, and therefore they are, when they take the tablets, in the morning they are T3 toxic, and by the evening they are a bit under, so it's really not, not a good choice. Another, well, I went to the other question, go on, yes. Um, hi Karim, it's just the practicalities of giving placebos in, in clinics, because Yes, for T3, that's useful, but there are other drugs like statins and bisphosphonates where patients say they get side effects. Mm -hmm. um, do you have to get research ethics? How practically could we give people placebos? Okay, so just about placebos, so really interestingly, I've discovered, and there's a whole lot of people doing this, you can tell people this is a placebo, but it will work. And in a proportion of people, it works. It's quite amazing, okay? They know it's a placebo. In fact, I bought my placebos uh, f from an online website that does homeopathy. So homeopathy is full of placebo, and they seem to recognize it, but they add a bit of homeopathy to the placebo tablet, but it's driven, it's, it's derived from a placebo tablet. So 
There is, a, I've had, since I gave a, a similar talk uh, last month, I've had a few people approach me from the alternative practitioners wanting to use placebos in other ways and research it. So placebos, um, knowing it's a placebo is not necessarily a bad thing. Kareem, um, one of the problems in Cardiff is that all the really good endocrinologists don't do private practice. So some of these slip through the net to me. And um, often with overbearing parents, and it strikes me that the problem is usually the relationship between the patient and the parent. You said that, you know, explore if there are traumas. I mean, it, do you, how much do you find and what do you do about it? Okay, so, so interestingly, Almost all of the patients have had a, young, a terrible trauma about 10, 15, 20 years ago and then started treatment. And a lot of them, that has been resolved, but they're not off the T3 because they're still on it. And so those people actually, once they tell you all this and you tell them, do you think that might make you tired and they agree with you? And then we try the weaning process and it works. So you, once they've expressed their stress, I find it a lot easier. I mean, I'm becoming a talking therapist at the end of it. <laughs> That's the truth of it. And then I refer them on to, I mean, the problem is it's very hard to find good NHS talking therapy, but we definitely need much, much more of it. My regular weekly work includes the endocrine antenatal clinic where I see young women who are pregnant and taking levothyroxin. And I always go back to find out how big the problem was, where the diagnosis was, what the background is, you know, TSH 60, five years ago. A good number have no good reason for taking even levothyroxine, and they're coming to me in their mid-20s. Um, I just cannot find, and then they tell me the story, and oh my goodness, it's, I don't know what percentage, but it's, it's fairly frequent. It could easily be 10 or 15% of the people I see, young women, taking levothyroxine without a good indication. So I really recognize that, that you, you were describing problem. there. When I came back from the BES this time, I said to my colleagues who didn't make it, so what would you like to hear about from the BES? You, you call and I'll, I'll give you the update. T3, that's what they wanted to hear about. They want some guidance on T3. Well, you've given it to us today, so I'm going to say, Karim, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Can I add... Uh... A question. There's nothing like clinical medicine and cases to sharpen up our perceptive skills. So thank you very much to the next two case presentation speakers. Uh, we have a case called medullary thyroid cancer presenting as ectopic Cushing's. I think I've made the diagnosis already. But anyway. You've given the surprise away. <laughs> so that was a tough act to follow, but let's see. Um, good afternoon, my name is Bhavna, I'm one of the endocrine ST5s, previously at London Northwest, now at Imperial, and I'll be presenting an interesting case of ectopic Cushing's. The reason why we call this case intriguing is not only because of diagnostic surprises, but also because of very unique patient factors. And indeed, all of us know that patient ideas, concerns, and expectations are the basis of any basic clinical practice. So I promise you an interesting case, but it starts out a bit boring. So this was a 65-year-old gentleman who came to us in COVID times with the usual symptoms of cough and fever. Curiously, in the past five months, he had been diagnosed with new hypertension, new diabetes, new COPD, and new schizophrenia and depression. On examination, he was noted to be vividly psychotic with proximal myopathy, which had rendered him newly bedbound. The most concerning feature in his bloods was a severe and refractory hypokalemia. This was someone who needed admission to the high dependency unit and was receiving upwards of 300 millimoles of potassium chloride a day. He was also noted to have metabolic alkalosis, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesemia. Because he was so unwell, the only imaging we could do was a CT chest abdomen pelvis, which showed some interstitial lung infiltrates which weren't really characterized, and bilateral adrenal enlargement. <laughs> Looking at his cortisol levels, he was found to have a raised 24-hour urinary cortisol and a raised midnight plasma cortisol. His ACTH levels were quite impressive. Both on his overnight dexamethasone suppression test and low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, we did not see any response. Putting things together at this point, We've got someone with an impressive ACTH with complete lack of suppression, 
hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, and bulky adrenals. So we were quite confident that we were dealing with someone with ACTH-dependent Cushing's, more likely to be an ectopic source. But this was someone who was extremely unwell and he needed acute management before anything else. And that's why he was started on a trial of metyrapon, which was gradually titrated upwards to aim a cortisol around 300. Um, Meplerinone was added in order to help with correction of hypokalemia. And gradually, he was brought down to a block and replace regime, where we blocked him with metyrapron 1 gram QDS and replaced it with 3 milligrams of prednisolone. This bought us some time and some clinical stability. And we were able to order lots of investigations. Please notice that all of these are non-invasive investigations, which was on patient and family request. He had a pituitary MRI done, which was normal. A CT chest abdomen pelvis. There was a bit of gap between the initial CT when he came in acutely. And this was about two months later, but now we saw a left thyroid mass with some supraclavicular and median sternal deposits. There were also concerns regarding tracheal invasion and esophageal invasion. Total date scan significantly did not show any tracer uptake. FTG PET showed moderate uptake around the lesion that was described. Alongside, there was also uptake in the liver, which was queried to be metastasis. Putting things together, we were very concerned that this is someone who's got a large mass, which might be going into his trachea or his esophagus. So he was planned for surgical intervention. When he actually went into surgery, a bit of tumor was taken out, but some parts of it were deemed unresectable. But this was the first invasive investigation we could do on him, and we obtained histopathology. The histopathology was characteristic for medullary thyroid cancer and did stain positive for all of these markers, which are all neuroendocrine markers. He was also positive for calcitonin and CEA. The ACTH was, however, negative. We were able to run some genetics also, and he tested positive for a somatic Brett mutation, but he was negative for germline mutations. So putting things together again, now we had someone with an unresectable medullary thyroid cancer, which was red positive with liver metastasis. And according to NICE guidelines, he was started on carbozatinib. Now carbozatinib is a very nice medication. It acts on several points in tumor pathophysiology. It acts on the vascular endothelial cells directly on the tumor cells. And because it acts on so many parts, it does have its share of side effects. And we dealt with that quite a lot. So if you look at the calcitonin levels, these are serum calcitonin levels plotted over a period of time. He was on carbozatinib for about a year or so. You can see that very nicely, the basal calcitonin came down quite acutely when he was started on carbozatinib. But then you see these highs and lows. This is all related to patient compliance. So this was someone who already had a psychiatric diagnosis. At this point, he was inpatient in a psychiatry unit. And his main problem was that his psychosis involved thinking that he's got snakes in his tummy. And unfortunately, this carbozatinib was giving him abdominal pain and nausea, which was reinforcing that psychosis. So we struggled with it. And he was on the minimalist dose of carbozatinib for about a year. With this, the radiology didn't really improve and the liver metastasis kept increasing and the liver almost became replaced with cancer cells. He was then trialed on cerebral catenib, which has actually been quite recently started. And the reason why I put a great dipper there, because it was a great dipper for his calcitonin levels. His calcitonin levels from 20,000 declined to 62.5 units on starting cerebral catenib, which was excellent results for us. Tolerance and side effects was also much better. Efficacy of cerebral catenib has been established in red altered thyroid cancers, and it was fortunate that this gentleman was positive for red. So what did we learn from this patient? When we're medical students, we're always taught that if you want to be a good physician or a great physician, you treat a patient, you don't treat a disease. And if you think about it, in this patient, we actually treated him for three different diseases, and we might have saved his life three different times. He started out by being an ectopic ACTH 
profoundly um, with profound uh, deranged electrolytes, which were managed with medical management of Cushing's. Then we moved on to surgical management, trying to debulk a tumor, which was compressing vital organs. And then we, when we obtained histology, we were able to put him on some fancy targeted therapies to control the source. So with the multidisciplinary management, this patient actually was a prime example of how we treated a patient's journey and not the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have some questions or comments? The tumor was causing Cushing's. So the problem is that we couldn't really do an IPSS on him because he had someone who had uh, somebody pass away quite close to him after having a bronchoscopy and he thought the IPSS was similar to a bronchoscopy and the family was very insistent on it. And the histology itself did not test positive for ACTH, but we did request for precursor markers on the histology, which unfortunately didn't come back. But our working diagnosis was let's treat it like as, as an occult ACTH and treat the medullary cancer separately. So two diagnoses, the first uh, not laboratory confirmed, and the second laboratory confirmed. Right. We were just treating what we saw. Sure. Any comments or questions? Would you like to send some urine to Vibke when she's up and running? Would that, would that be? Hmm? <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. You finish with a little slide of William Osler, who's one of my heroes. So if you didn't catch that, just go and look at William Osler. Oh, no. And finally, a tale of two multifocal papillary thyroid cancers. Oh, great. And there's one more. One more case after Menti, that. No, no, Menti question. Uh, one, more, one more Menti question. Phone's back out. And away we go. And I'm going to say thank you again for bringing these cases. It's quite challenging presenting your cases in front of a critical audience, um, but you enliven up our meeting so much by doing it. So uh, thank you, and thank you also for this case to come. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, sticking around. My name's Nick. I'm one of the endocrine F1s at St. Mary's, and um, I'm taking the opportunity today to present two multifocal papillary thyroid cancer cases. Or attempted. Um, the first case is a 31-year-old male who presents the head and neck clinic with a painless lump in the right supraclavicular fossa. On ultrasound, the lump is found to be an 8 millimeter partially cystic lymph node at right level 4, and then they also find a 5 millimeter U5, so highly suspicious lesion, in the right, right lobe of the thyroid. Cytology, however, was less definitive, and this kind of raises the first question that we were hoping to ask, where essentially you have a highly suspicious lesion on ultrasound that's not quite backed up cytologically, but you also have follicular cells on lymph node biopsy. And essentially the question we we're asking is, what's the recommended management from here? Are you hopefully still all online with this? So first option is, do we repeat an ultrasound scan in six months? Do you repeat the fine needle aspira? Do you do a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy? And all these are sub-centimeter. And this is a small one, yeah. Five to eight millimeters. Mm. Thank you. Okay, interesting. Quite a spread, isn't there? Yeah. This is what's the recommended planet. Okay. So from this, especially following the talks you've had earlier today, this is quite useful information. The consensus at the time was based on the like potential nodal involvement. This could be a likely thyroid cancer with nodal involvement, and 
they went straight ahead with a total thyroidectomy and selective lymph node dissection. Histology comes back showing a three millimeter right lobe focal pillary thyroid carcinoma, no vascular invasion and fully contained to the thyroid. However, there's multiple smaller foci surrounding that, the largest being 1.3, the majority being between 0.3 and 0.5 millimeters. All of these are fully confined to the thyroid and they're fully excised. As for the nodes, um, two of the 19 resected at level five were found, uh, sorry, the two at, were at level five were found to contain metastatic disease. And so the final classification was a T1A, N1B, because it's level five, and then no metastasis in an R0 resection. So the patient underwent um, iodine ablation after this in view of the lymph node metastasis. The SPECT CT that was carried out at the same time showed that there was no uptake anywhere except the remnant thyroid bed. Uh, they got a bit of skin contamination, hence the cheek uptake. And the patient remains disease-free to this date at six months. The second case is slightly different. It's a 44-year-old lady who presents the thyroid clinic with a painless lump in the neck. She has a past medical history of hypothyroidism and a family history of thyroid cancer, but we don't know much beyond this because her family lives abroad. Ultrasound imaging shows an eight millimeter, slightly less suspicious lesion from the first in the right lobe of the thyroid. Elastography finds it to have some calcification and so it's put as U4. Finally, the aspira identifies the lesion to be also slightly suspicious at thigh four. The consensus at the time that this was a likely thyroid cancer without nodal disease, and they went to, underwent a diagnostic right hemithyroidectomy. Histology shows that there is a focus measuring 12 millimeters, showing early signs of extra thyroid extension, and also a second focus measuring 0.2 millimeters confined to the thyroid, no vascular invasion. So in view of this, there's multifocal disease and early features of extra thyroid extension. And so the patient was, uh, underwent a completion thyroidectomy. Histology here shows a further focus measuring 1.25 millimeters fully confined to the thyroid. And with this information, the patient was offered radioiodine ablation, but declined due to childcare commitments. COVID happens and the patient uh, unfortunately didn't receive a one year ultrasound scan, however, did have regular follow up where um, they had neck examination. There was no signs of recurrence during this period. Thyroglobulin remains undetectable, antibody negative. However, in early 2022, she presents with a left node painless. Ultrasound finds this to be a reactive left jugular lymph node, and then incidentally, two echogenic right paratracheal nodes are identified. Finally, the last book confirms these to be metastatic. Patient undergoes um, iodine ablation, and SPECT CT shows the only uptake to be in the um, left thyroid bed, the remnant, and a thyroglossal tract uptake. And interestingly, no uptake in those right paratracheal nodes, suggestive that there's an unclear response to radioiodine treatment. You'll be receiving follow-up in the upcoming months. So in summary, we have one case of a T1A with nodal disease, multifocal, and post-operative ablation with no recurrence, and another slightly more advanced T-stage with no nodal metastasis without radioiodine ablation that has a right paratracheal paratracheal recurrence at two years and an unclear response to radioiodine ablation, which essentially raises the question is what's the definitive management, management in multifocal disease? Um, this wouldn't have been possible without everybody involved in the management of this patient. And I think it's, uh, this is only a small amount. So thank you to everyone involved. Some trials have more authors than patients. I think this study has more authors than or contributors than cells. <laughs> um, I'm really struck by how small these lesions were. Mm. Uh, not long ago in this room, I think we're talking hours rather than months or years, we heard don't bother if it's less than 10 millimeters. 
that that's true C can i say but Indeed. actually the first case did have lymph node metastasis and uh, so in the answer to your question for the question is that it wasn't just the size of the lesion within the thyroid it was the almost certain and confirmed lymph node metastasis and the point of these two is their multifocality. So uh, David Scott Coombs here. So completely agree. Um, total difference when you've got patients who present with lymph node metastases. Just a couple of comments. Uh, I'd have done the same as you in the first case, but if you really wanted to have a preoptive diagnosis, you could have tried aspirating the cystic node and sending the aspirate for thyroglobulin, which is more successful than trying to biopsy sub-centimeter um, uh, tissue. Um, the, other, the other thing to say is the definition, as I understand it, of multifocality is more than three lesions. Um, and I think you only had two in that case, so I wouldn't have done a completion. And, and then I'm just curious as to why a patient who then presents with recurrent nodal disease is managed with radioiodine, because in my book, you would always resect first. And then I know she didn't have the radioiodine, but I would then do it afterwards. Can, whether the other can I comment on that? So the, uh, the American Thyroid Association for multifocality is two or more lesions. So needn't be three. Um, and there's also a difference if they're bilateral. Um, yes, uh, our, the um, uh, MDT will discuss these and consider the size of the lesions and the risk of surgery. And certainly our MDT, uh, Fausto and Neil, would definitely try and take out nodules if they were big enough and it was safe enough to proceed that way. But I would take their guidance as to the safety. Faster. Um, yeah, I, I concur with both of you. I mean, it's a judgment call, but you will know, like I know, that you could inject them with alcohol, you could wave a wand over them, you could do almost what you like, because generally speaking, single or two very small lymph nodes in the lateral neck may sit there for a decade or more and do nothing. So one thing, one of the things that we're trying to do, we'd like to get off the ground is one of these alternative treatments for those patients who, as your cancer practice gets larger and larger, you're following up more and more patients, these these patients become significant in number. So a, a way of dealing with this with non-surgical means and non-radiological, non no radioiodine means is uh, highly desirable. It, that's it's, also a question of whether they've had the iodine, which facilitates long-term follow-up and interpretation of the thyroglobulin. Fausto, that's... Um idea of a lymph node just sitting there doing nothing for decades. Is that what used to be called lateral aberrant thyroid? That, that description um, referred to those patients who often, often had this scenario, but with larger lateral nodes. So in other words, a microcarcinoma, often an impalpable thyroid nodule, but a lump in the lateral neck, which on biopsy just seemed like normal thyroid tissue. That, and that was so that was misinterpreted as, as embryological displaced um, thyroid. Of course, it's not, it's lateral nodal disease. So what I'm thinking is that when our thyroid ultrasound scan is done, if the, if the radiologist finds a sub-centimeter nodule in the thyroid gland, their examination of the neck, of the lymph nodes, regional lymph nodes, is critical. Because if they then say there's something trivial in the right thyroid lobe and there are a couple of little things that might be lymph nodes, so maybe you better not think it's trivial, maybe we better take this further, is more important than their comments on, on the nodule itself, in a sense. Is, is that fair? 
you know, absolutely, it's a, it's a different disease. One of the problems we have is that 10% of the general population will have a papillary thyroid microcarcinoma in their thyroid if they had their thyroid gland out for other reasons. But there is a subgroup of those microcarcinomas that will metastasize. It's a very small group because we don't see that many of these patients that have microcarcinomas with metastases. In the future, I'm sure that we will identify uh, biological markers that allow us to distinguish which, the, the, or predict, sorry, the, the natural history of each microcarcinoma. And that will change the way we treat things much in the same way as we will have predictions about adrenals. Can I just say, because um, it can be confusing, uh, the attitude about the reliability of ultrasound of thyroid nodules in predicting malignancy is variable and controversial and, and all that. But there is no doubt that a good ultrasonographer can characterize with great sensitivity and specificity uh, met metastatic nodal disease. So we put much more emphasis on the ultrasound report of the nodes. I'd still say, even though ultimately the patient was going to end up needing surgery, that according to ATA guidelines and BTA, you should not have biopsied that second lesion or that lesion in that, that second patient because it was subcentimeter with, with no, 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 no negative and should have been followed up. Many of us were thinking down that path. Thank you for verbalizing that. Any more questions or comments? Thank you again. You can see how engaged we are even at the end of the afternoon. That was really good. Thank you. I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank you all for coming and not being among the, the 55 people who decided to uh, come to this meeting for